They, they will be here. Joe, you can, for the reaction shot, you can hear us on the stage. We don't want you on the stage when we're talking, when Max talking to the podium, but if, if that's a better angle or whatever, after. Just a, hey, yeah. But for the initial, hey, we're in, if, if you want to move here, you can. They're going to be walking in from that side here in two minutes. Uh, is Lionel Dip in there? No. No. I, so, I was told. I didn't see it. I, you said I don't think so. 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 I Five seat, what do you got? Seven. Dude, I was a trumpeter back in the day. Okay. But, yeah, let's go. I had a box. I played in a, a strap. A three seat box strap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So.
welcome to today's selection show, Watch Party, at beautiful DJ Sokol Arena. Thanks to an outstanding body of work this season, Creighton is all but assured a spot in the NCAA tournament. It'll be the team's 24th postseason appearance in the past 26 years, a mark of consistency that few teams nationally can match. Let's begin with our head coach. He's won 297 games over his 13 seasons at the helm, including over 100 Big East wins. Creighton owns six seasons all time with 25 or more wins, and he's coached four of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the head coach of the Blue Jays, Greg McDermott. And now let's meet the 2022-23 Creighton wins basketball team. A 6'8 freshman from Omaha, Nebraska, number zero, Jason Green. A 6'4 freshman from Northridge, California, number one, Ben Schultzberg. A 6'7 freshman from Germantown, Tennessee, number 10, Xander Yates. A 6'9 freshman from Germantown, Tennessee, number 13, Mason Miller. A 5'11 freshman from Alpine, Utah, number 21, Evan Young. A 6'10 freshman from Mangrove Cape, Bahamas, number 33, Frederick King. A six foot sophomore from Aurora, Ontario, Canada, number two, Ryan Nemhard. A 6'3 sophomore from Seattle, Washington, number 15, John Christopoulos. A 6'4 sophomore from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And all Big East honorable mention, number 23, Trey Alexander. A 6'7 sophomore from Glendale, Arizona. Number 24, Arthur Kaluma. A 6'1 junior from Omaha, Nebraska. Number 4, Shreve. Mitchell, a 7-1 junior from Florissant, Missouri, all Big East first teamer and Big East defensive player of the year. Number 11, Ryan Kalkbrenner, a 6-4 junior from Oak Lawn, Illinois, number 14, Sammy Osmani. A 6'3 senior from Argentina, number five, Francisco Farabello. And finally, a 6'7 senior from Aurora, Nebraska. An all Big East honorable mention, number 55, Baylor Shireman. Fans, let's have a big round of applause for your Creighton Blue Jays. The show is about to get underway. Let's see where the Blue Jays are heading this year. Let's sit back, relax, and let the madness begin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. John Bishop here from Sokol Arena, where today the Creighton Blue Jays find out where they are headed for the men's NCAA tournament. And then in just a couple of hours, the Creighton women will get their assignment to March Madness. We are bringing you this special live exclusive coverage of Selection Sunday. Today's program is going to work a little bit differently. You're going to be seeing just a lot of the live reaction of the players. We're also going to take you behind the scenes to the press conference once the men's Selection Pete Field has been announced, and you'll hear from Coach Mack and some of the players. I'll be back kind of sporadically in and out to bring you some facts and figures of where the Jays are going, who they're going to be playing, and how the rest of the bracket shapes up. 
We will be live here on 1620 The Zone TV through the women's show tonight. So even during the uh, interim period between this selection show and the next selection show, we'll uh, we'll keep this line open. You'll be able to uh, follow along with all the activities here at Sokol Arena. Tonight's, of course, men's selection show you can watch on CBS. So you can kind of use this as a uh, as an accompaniment to the CBS selection show. And uh, you'll be able to see the live reaction from the players. This is the same feed that's being sent across the country to CBS. So when the uh, Jays are announced, no doubt they will switch to this camera. But you'll be able to see it in real time as it happens. And then uh, Coach Mack is expected to speak here in front of the crowd that's assembled here at Sokol Arena. We'll bring all of that to you here. And then again, later on tonight, 7 o'clock on ESPN, is the women's selection show. And we will we'll, we will still be here on 1620 The Zone TV, and you will be able to watch along with the women's selection show. Real quick, before we uh, get ready, the uh, CBS broadcast is scheduled to start here in about six minutes. And the latest bracketology from our friends at Bracket Matrix, this is an average of nearly 100 different bracketologists. Their last update and their final update is 83 different brackets and as of right now, Creighton is squarely in the middle of the seven line right behind Missouri and ahead of Northwestern and Michigan State. There's been some speculation that maybe the Jays could be on the six seed line. Just kind of looking across at some of where the bracketologists are right now, it looks like six is the highest and a, a roughly about 20 different bracketologists have Creighton as a six seed. The majority have them as a seven. There's a couple of folks who have Creighton, I believe, as low as a nine because I'm looking across the board here. And, no, actually, there's one bracketologist that has them crashing the dance. If you want to at them on Twitter, you can make fun of them. They have Creighton all the way down at a 10 seed. But for the most part, the consensus is that the Blue Jays are going to be a seven seed for the NCAA tournament. Now, we'll find out what happens here in just a few minutes once the brackets are announced. But should note, I went back and uh, did a little historical data over the last four NCAA tournaments, of course, skipping 2020 because there was no NCAA tournament. For the most part, bracket matrix is really close. They have hit all the number one seeds. They've missed all but just one of the number two seeds. It gets a little fuzzier as you get down the line, but still they hit anywhere from 10 to 12 of the last 16 seven seeds and very few times are the bracket matrix off by as much as two. So that means any that means Creighton basically is anywhere going from a five to a nine. So I'm afraid our busting the brackets matrix uh, on the bracket matrix is going to be wrong because bracket matrix has never missed a team by more than two spots of where they are actually seated in the NCAA tournament. So. I would guess right now you're looking at a seven. If you're wondering about possible matchups, well, right now the other 10 seeds, according to Bracket Matrix, are Auburn, Boise State, Utah State, and USC. So if you're kind of pinpointing who the Jays might play, those are the four teams to be on the lookout for. I would also look out for Illinois, Penn State, Mississippi State, North Carolina State, Rutgers, Pitt, and yes, possibly a rematch with Arizona State. Remember, the Jays went to Las Vegas and lost to uh, Arizona State just a uh, just a few short weeks ago in Las Vegas. So there could be a rematch, not guaranteed, obviously, but still a possibility. So those are some of the teams we're going to be on the lookout for to show up on that line where the Jays end up in terms of regional seating or in terms of regional placement and or where they play Thursday or Friday of opening weekend. That, of course, is yet to be determined. Typically, we'll see the brackets. They will be announced. You'll see the matchup. The game times will come out a little bit later on. I would anticipate we may actually find out the game times sometime between the end of this men's selection show and the women's selection show. Obviously, if that happens, we'll bring that to you here on 1620 The Zone TV. If you are wondering... If you can't make it to your television, if you want to listen along, 1620 The Zone Radio, 1620 AM, has the uh, NCAA Men's Selection Show from Westwood One, the official home of the NCAA Tournament. So if you want to listen to the bracket reveal on the radio, that is available on 1620 AM 
our regular over-the-air radio channel. This program exclusively here on 1620 The Zone TV. They're just getting ready to wrap up the coverage of the Big Ten tournament won by Purdue. So the Boilermakers have won the both regular season and the postseason championship in the Big Ten Conference. And now after this commercial break, we're going to get Selection Sunday. So again, it's not going to be a full-fledged show in that it's going to be a lot of talking. We may get a few guests come over here table side. It depends. Obviously, once the brackets are released, the guys immediately go straight to work. The coaches go to scouting. They've been doing their work already in the short hours since we came back. We arrived home last night at about 7 o'clock local time. They've already been doing their scouring and trying to get some advanced look. And then the video people headed up by Casey Matthews is going to get all the clips ready to go. So the guys will have some scouting reports ready for tomorrow. And then, of course, we'll find out. Typically, the Jays will fly out two days before the first game. So if the Jays do get a Thursday-Saturday slot, that means they're flying out on Tuesday, which means just one more day here in Omaha. If the games are Friday, Sunday, then the Blue Jays would likely fly out on Wednesday. That's typically how we've done it over the last few years. One other thing to note as we get ready for March Madness is that CBS is doing their all-access behind the scenes. You might recall 10 years ago in Doug McDermott's senior year, they did a behind-the-scenes look at Creighton and they showed some of the activities of the week. Well, they are back again this year. They're going to be behind the scenes with the Jays. You'll be able to see some of those things on the CBS and Turner broadcasts of March Madness. And, of course, they'll be tweeting them out through their various social media channels as well. So that'll be something worth watching for here in the uh, in the coming days. CBS All Access behind the scenes will be following Creighton and a handful of other teams through March Madness. Hopefully, uh, it'll last at least a couple of weekends. Uh, unfortunately, the last time we didn't get it, uh, we only lasted one weekend the last time that uh, CBS All Access was with us. So that's what we have coming up for you. March Madness Selection Show on CBS is about to begin. We'll go radio silent here on this end so you can all watch along. You'll be able to watch the live reaction from the Jays as soon as there is activity at the podium or in the behind-the-scenes press conference. We'll take you there live as well. It is time to find out where the Jays are dancing in March Madness. So enjoy the broadcast. I'll be back spir sporadically with some news and notes about some of the other teams that have been selected in the tournament and an early scouting report on who the Jays will be playing in round one of the NCAA tournament. The show is underway, so enjoy, friends, and we will be back here momentarily with some more narration of what's to happen today here at Sokol Arena. Waiting for your name to be called. I've been, I've been at Hofstra, I've been mid-major, I've been at Villanova 1C, but I'm thinking about my guys today. In 2008, we were the last team to get in, and I'm thinking about the anxiety we had that day, but the excitement, too. And everybody that's thinking that way right now, we're with you. Enjoy it. We're going to get to it fast. <laughs> yeah. No, excited. I just like to see the matchups. You know how I feel. I've been watching games since October championship now it's time to see where these teams that have earned the right to play in the best national tournament in the country are going to land and who they're going to match up it has been a wild and woolly season in college basketball the tournament's going to be awesome as always mr gumble if you please sure read the name <laughs> without further delay let's begin the reveal here are the tournament brackets from the ncaa and its corporate champion capital one we begin in the south region where the overall number one seed is the alabama crimson tide for the first time in school history, they've earned a one seed in this NCAA tournament. 29 wins to set a school record. They sidestepped a situation involving criminal activity in which Brandon Miller was associated. He was not charged. They are here as the number one overall seed. And they will be in the first and second round games in Birmingham, Alabama on Thursday and Saturday. They will meet the winner of the first four game in Dayton, Ohio on Tuesday between Texas A&M's Islanders, Corpus Christi Islanders, 23 and 10. 
on the season. They beat Northwestern State and make it consecutive Southland tournament titles. They will go up against Southeast Missouri State, the Red Hawks out of the Ohio Valley, their first NCAA tournament since the year 2000. They captured the Ohio Valley Conference Tournament with a big overtime win against Tennessee Tech. Now, continuing on down the South region, the eighth seed, the Terps of Maryland out of the Big Ten. They've got Jameer Young. There were questions about him. He leads the Terps in scoring and assists Maryland with a 21-2 record overall. They'll be up against West Virginia's Mountaineers out of the Big 12. Coach Bob Huggins making his 26th NCAA tournament appearance. There's going to be some bruises coming out of that game. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one. First and second round games in Orlando, Florida on Thursday and Saturday. The fifth seed Aztecs of San Diego State. Aztecs won the Mountain West regular season title for the third time in the last four seasons. They will meet the number 12 seed from the Colonial Athletic Association, the Cougars of Charleston, 31 and three. What a terrific season. <laughs> this team knows how to win. They're deep. They shoot a bunch of threes, score the ball at a high rate. This is going to be one of those 12-5 matchups that I could see people picking Charleston, and I would too. That's a terrific team, and that matchup would be comfortable for The them. four seed in the South as they continue to celebrate in Charleston. The Cavaliers of Virginia out of the Atlantic Coast Conference, 25 and seven. They want to share of the ACC regular season title. They will meet the Paladins of Furman University. School record 27 wins on the year, 27 and seven overall. First time since 1980 going that's to a, the NCAA. That's tournament. a tough matchup for Virginia. The Paladins are excellent and intelligent. And they're a little bit psyched, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to first and second round games to be played in Denver, Colorado on Friday and Sunday. Out of the Big East, the sixth seed, the Creighton Blue Jays. Conference game. They will take on the 11th seed Wolfpack of North Carolina State second team out of the ACC. And that is a bubble team. North Carolina State checking it at number 11, not even in the first four. I thought they might get left out. Maybe it bodes well for the ACC. We'll see. All right, the number three seed in the South, the Baylor Bears at 22 and 10. They finished tied for third in the very, very tough Big 12, winning 11 games. They will meet the Gauchos of UC Santa Barbara out of the Big West. Gauchos, Big West regular season co-champs, and they won the Big West tournament title. First and second round games in Sacramento, California. The second team out of the SEC, Missouri Tigers, the number seven seed, got off to a 9-0 and start on the season, finished 24-9 and on the season. They'll eight, the second seed, the second team out of the Mountain West and the 10th seed, the Utah State Aggies. We were all impressed by them down the street. And a lot, some people had them out or last four in as a 10 seed comfortably in, and I agree with putting them there. All right, the number two seed in the South as we round out the South region. Out of the Pac-12, the Arizona Wildcats, second in the Pac-12, and then won the Pac-12 tournament title over the top seed UCLA. That's the best party right there. That's a good-looking party. <laughs> they will meet the 15th seed Princeton Tigers, winners of the Ivy League title, back-to-back 20-win -back seasons for the Princeton Tigers. So. Let's review this bracket as we slide back up to the top. What stands out to you, Seth? Well, many surprise Alabama getting the overall number one seed, passing Kansas and Houston. Both those teams lost. But this is my upset region, guys. You named it. Charleston beats San Diego State. Furman beats Virginia. Charleston to the Sweet 16. And UC Santa Barbara is going to the Sweet 16. Baylor's lost a couple first-round games over the years. Major. I'm giving it all, I'm oh, giving it all up the first round. All wow. in. Yeah, that's I mean, it. Fully Talk all in. Here. I'm, I'm interested in, I'm, in the rest of these 8-9 matchups. This is a doozy, as Jay said, two physical teams, up and down seasons. But I tell you what, that'll be a tough matchup. Whoever comes out of that game against most likely Alabama, that'll be a fun one to watch. Jay, take a look at the bottom part of this bracket for us. I, I like two games there. Utah State and Missouri, both of those teams can really score. That game could be in the 90s. That's going to be a fun one to watch. Yep. I also think Princeton is back to the peak career day. That is a team you do not want to face. They're executing at a high level. I still think Arizona will come through. All right, guys. The Capital One NCAA March Madness Bracket Challenge, the official bracket game of NCAA March Madness for both the men and women, is almost ready for your picks. Get your brackets started at play.ncaa.com. Dozens of teams across the country anticipating where they'll go, who they will play, including... Texas A&M, Kansas, K 
Kennesaw State, Oral Roberts, and Houston, to name a few. Quarter of the field is set. We reveal the Midwest region when the men's basketball championship selection show continues. The NCAA Men's Basketball Championship Selection Show is sponsored by AT&T 5G. Well, as you just heard, the Creighton Blue Jays not going to go to Des Moines, which uh, way back when at the beginning of the season, a lot of folks were hoping maybe the Jays would end up in Des Moines and then uh, routed through to Kansas City for the Sweet 16. But not a bad second act because the Jays, instead of heading east, will head just a few hours west to Denver, Colorado. And boy, talk about your reunions, if you will. Creighton and NC State, these two teams last saw each other in the Cayman Islands a few years ago, taking on the 11 seed Wolf Pack. And then if the Jays get through, could be a rematch with Baylor, the team that 10 years ago ended. Doug McDermott and company's tremendous campaign. So maybe a chance for a little bit of revenge against Baylor. And then you look at the bottom half of the bracket. You've got the seven Missouri against the 10 seed Utah State. And then at the bottom of the bracket, the Jays make it through to the regional finals or the regional semifinals. They could rematch with the Arizona Wildcats, the team that they saw in Maui back in November. So there's a lot of familiarity in this bracket. Of course, don't forget UCSB, the team they saw two years ago in route to the Sweet 16. So there's a lot of familiarity in this half of the bracket. And of course, at the top, very top, you've got the number one overall seed, Alabama Crimson Tide. So the Creighton Blue Jays are headed to Denver. Tickets, Available at NCAA.com slash tickets for season ticket holders. There's going to be emails going out here within the next probably 18 hours or so with more information on all of that. So be watching for that season ticket holders. If you're curious about how to get tickets for the event, should be an email coming out here within the next few hours. But for the rest of you, NCAA.com slash tickets to get the latest information on how you can be at the NCAA tournament in Denver. The Blue Jays against NC State. We'll go back to the live selection show here in a moment when they come back from break. But just a real quick scouting report on Kevin Keats's Wolfpack. It's a team this year that has averaged nearly 80 points a game, but they give up a lot of points as well. This is more of a high-tempo offense, top 100 in the country in terms of of tempo this season. They're 55th rated in Ken Palm. And uh, when you look at how much they, how often they shoot the three, they are 68th in the country in three point field goal percentage. So they will put up the three. It's a team that fouls a little bit. Uh, they're 222nd in the nation in fouls. Like the Jays, not a whole lot of bench points. They're led by Terquavion Smith, who's third in the ACC in scoring at 17 and a half points per game. We'll have more on NC State here in just a little bit. But right now, let's go back to the live coverage of the selection show from CBS live here at Sokol Arena with Creighton Basketball. I, I'm thrilled for Houston. I hope they get to Houston for the Final Four. I do not see the case for Houston over Kansas on the overall seed line. Why do we care? Because if Kansas is in this spot, Kansas is going to Kansas City. Now they have to go to one of the other two regions. Kansas had 10 more quad one wins and a much harder strength of schedule. I'm rooting for the Cougars. I love you guys, but I would have had Kansas here. <laughs> we'll be talking to the chair a bit later on. You can bring that up. They'll be facing the 16th seed Northern Kentucky Norse. Good season out of the Horizon League, 22 and 12. On the year, Marcus Warwick, their go-to guy, averages a team-high 19.1 points a game. Moving on, the Midwest region. The second team out of the Big Ten, the number eight seed. The
John Bishop back here at Soquel Arena, where tonight we've got Jays fans excited about the possibility of headed to Denver, Colorado. Jays are headed to Denver, and they will take on NC State in the first round of the men's NCAA tournament, with the winner to face either the three seed favorite or the 14 seed UCSB. We will get more information on game times, and of course, all the games will be able to be heard right here on 1620 The Zone, your home for great basketball and your home for the men's NCAA tournament. Tim Flannery is here. You can take a look at him, the women's team. You'll be hearing their names called within the next oh, probably hour and 45 minutes. The women's show will be on ESPN. You'll be able to catch it all right there. So we're going to get back to the men's selection show in just a moment. But well, we appreciate you hanging around today, and we will go live to the press conference as soon as it begins. The uh, Jays are going to sit out here, and we're going to watch the rest of the uh, selection of the field. We're halfway through the bracket, and then as soon as that is done, we'll hear a little bit from Coach back at the podium, and then they're going to head back, and we will bring you some live press conference action as well right here on 1620. So, so stand by. More to come here from Sokol Arena. Shake, shake, just to watch you shake, 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 oh man, shake, 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 make the whole crowd shake, 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 yeah. <laughs> ah, the madness of March on parallel. We are halfway through the bracket reveal. Let's see who else joins our 68 team tournament field. Back to the brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champion, AT&T 5G. We're now in the West region, lower right quadrant, where the Kansas Jayhawks are the third overall number one seed. The Jayhawks get the best of news today. Coach Bill Self, discharged from a hospital, yes. says he's looking forward to rejoining the team this week for the school's release. They are a one seed for the second straight year, 16th time overall. Yeah, that's the best news to know that Bill Self is recovering and going to be with this team going forward. Okay, who do they get to play? First and second round games to be played in Des Moines on Thursday and Saturday. They will be up against the 16th seed, Bison of Howard University. They return to the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1992. Moving on. The eighth seed, the Razorbacks of Arkansas, sixth seed out of the SEC, a 20 and 13 season overall, and eight and 10 in the SEC. They'll take on the ninth seed, Fighting Illini of Illinois, making it to their third straight NCAA tournament. Another great eight nine game. Man, we've got some great eight nine games. <laughs> a lot more fun to watch than the coaches. <laughs> the fifth seed. The Gales of St. Mary's from the West Coast Conference. They share the regular season West Coast Conference title with Gonzaga. They will meet the 12th seed Rams of VCU. They won the Atlantic 10 regular season title, went on to win the tournament championship, defeating Dayton. The fourth seed UConn Huskies are the third team out of the Big East. UConn got off to a 14-0 start this season. If you will remember, then lost 5 of 6, then won 9 of the last 11 regular Yeah, they're games. trending in the right direction and a very, very dangerous team capable of getting to Houston. Yeah. And they will take on the Gales of Iona. Coach Rick Pitino leading the Gales to 17 wins and a regular season title, then ran away from Maris in the tournament final. The New Yorkers are going to love that game. <laughs> First and second round games now in Denver, Colorado on Friday and Sunday. The sixth seed, the Horned Frogs of TCU. Highlight of their season, a 23-point road win at Kansas. They are the sixth team out of the Big 12. They'll play... Winner of the first four game in Dayton, Wednesday. It'll be the Arizona State Sun Devils out of the Pac-12, taking on the Wolfpack of Nevada. A couple of weeks ago, right here on CBS, we saw Desmond Cambridge of yep. Arizona State sink a half-court shot to win at Arizona, put them in the tournament. He will never pay for another meal in Tempe again. <laughs> <laughs> the number three seed. In the West region, the Bulldogs of Gonzaga. Coach Mark Few makes it 23 straight NCAA tournament appearances. The Bulldogs, 28-5 overall. They'll meet the Antelopes of Grand Canyon from the Western Athletic Conference. They were 24-11 on the year. They won. They had to win four games in their tournament, the WAC tournament title in the past three years. They're second out of the WAC. Now, first and second round games in Sacramento, California on Thursday and Saturday from the Big Ten. 
the Northwestern Wildcats. 21 and 11, Coach Chris Collins, <laughs> Coach of the Year. Second trip for the Wildcats to the tournament. Hey, they have their fun. And they earned in it. Illinois. They earned it. Great Terrific surprise. season. Second place finish in the Big Ten, where they were 12 and 8. Who will they meet? Out of the Mountain West. It's the Broncos of Boise State. The Broncos go to consecutive NCAA tournament appearances for just the second time in their school history. Terrific season at 24 and 9. And rounding out the West region, the third team out of the Pac-12, UCLA Bruins. For the first time in a decade, UCLA won the Pac-12 regular season championship, winning the league by four games over Arizona. Jaime Jaquez Jr. was the Pac-12 player of the year as the Bruins went 29-5 and overall on the season. Who do they get? They get those Bulldogs from UNC Asheville out of the Big South after winning the Big South regular season and tournament title. Bulldogs overcame a 14-point second half deficit to win the Big South tournament title over Campbell. And, got, and they have one of the best players in the country and Drew Pember, a name to remember, folks. 6'9", can shoot it and plays defense at a high level protecting the rim. All right, let's go back to the top of the bracket and back to you, Jay Wright. I like Arkansas here against Illinois. And if Arkansas can get past Illinois, which is going to be a great game, they match up with Kansas really well. Their length and speed, Nick Smith now playing like he is, they could give Kansas a problem right there, a second-round game. We saw VCU today win an A-10 championship. They're not playing around, and I think that they're going to beat St. Mary's in that 5-12 game. And what did we do to deserve UConn versus Iona? The rumored Big East career for Rick Pitino might be getting a bit of an early start there. I know UConn wanted to go to the Garden, and I'm looking forward potentially – to a rematch of that epic Final Four game oh, between yeah. Gonzaga and UCLA. And I have to say, with the injury issues for UCLA, I think Gonzaga wins that game, goes to the Elite Eight. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing, Seth, but keep an eye on those Texas fr Frogcorns. They are a terrific team. Mike Miles is outstanding in the backcourt. Remember, they blew Kansas out in Lawrence earlier in the season. This is a very scary team, seated number six. All right, guys, so it's game on. Fill out your men's and women's brackets for a chance to win an all-new Nissan area. A trip to the 2024 Final Four. Learn more at cbsports.com backslash Nissan. Only one quadrant remains. Several teams remain on edge. Among those waiting their fate, Florida Atlantic, Oral Roberts, Kansas State, and Marquette. We will reveal the final region. The selection show continues live here on CBS. Where it began, I can't begin to know it, but then I know it's growing strong. Wasn't the spring, and spring became the summer, who'd have believed you'd come along? Hands, touching hands, reaching out, touching me, touching you. Touching warm, reaching out, touching me, touching you. Sweet Caroline, good times 
Discovery would like to recognize and thank our official NCAA corporate champions and corporate partners for their ongoing support of the NCAA and NCAA student athletes throughout the year. Welcome back, everyone. Three brackets down, one to go. Still several teams and their fans kind of biting their nails to see what's going to happen, but the wait is now over. Back to the tournament bracket show from the NCAA and its corporate champions. We are now in the lower left quadrant, the East region, where the Boilermakers of Purdue are the fourth overall number one seed for the fourth time in school history. First time since 96, the Boilermakers are a one seed. They won the Big Ten regular season title, went on to win the Big Ten tournament title. Pretty good season under Matt Painter, 29 and five overall. They will play the winner of the first four game in Dayton, Ohio on Wednesday. That game will be between Texas Southern Tigers. Coach Johnny Jones, his first losing season at Texas Southern, they still reach the NCAA tournament, winning their third straight Southwest Athletic Conference tournament title. The other opponent, FDU, out of the Northeast. FDU won four games last season, 19 and 15 overall, and the winner of that game will play Purdue. Moving on, the Memphis Tigers, second seed out of the American Athletic, 26 and 8 overall. Penny Hardaway's team upset the number one team in the nation, Houston Cougars, for the American tournament that title. That is the most dangerous eight seed in the field, folks. The Memphis Tigers, Kendrick Davis, a dynamic do-it-all point guard. They will be a problem and a tough out. And there's Florida Atlantic celebrating what they know is going to happen. They have school record with their 31 wins, 31-3 and three on the year. Second time in school history after winning the Conference USA tournament title. Congratulations to the Owls. First and second round games to be played in Orlando on Thursday and Saturday. The Duke Blue Devils, the number five seed, 26 and eight on the year, won the ACC tournament title, knocking off number two seed Virginia. No team playing any better, and Jeremy Roach's return to health really has keyed this late season run for the Blue Devils. Out of the Summit League, their opponent will be Oral Roberts. The Golden Eagles going undefeated in Summit League play, 18 and 0 on the year. 30 and 4 on the season. They have themselves a good year. They certainly did. And they've got Max A. Smith, one of the outstanding scorers in the country. Him and Roach going head to head. Can't it's wait to put the isolated seven, cam on that woo. one. 7 5 transfer from Arkansas who can shoot yes. threes. Connor Hanover. Yes, sir. The fourth seed, the Tennessee Volunteers out of the SEC, 23 and 10 on the year, 11 and 7 in the conference. They make it five straight NCAA appearances, and they will meet out of the Sun Belt, the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. 26 and 7 on the year. They return to the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2014 as they beat South Alabama in the Sun Belt Tournament Finals. Now, moving on down, first and second round games to be played in Greensboro, North Carolina on Friday and Sunday. Out of the SEC, the Kentucky Wildcats, 21 and 11 on the year. Coach John Calipari led the Wildcats to a third place finish in the SEC and 11 and 3. SEC finish. They have Oscar Shibway. Enough said. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Providence Friars, they'll be the opponent. Fourth theme out of the Big East. Bryce Hopkins, wow. a Kentucky transfer, yeah. leads the Friars in scoring, rebounding, and double doubles. Seth, do you, what do you think about Providence? Are they closer than we thought? Well, that's about where a lot of people thought, but that's one of the last bubble teams. So if you're a bubble team and you see them coming up, you're not feeling good. All right. The Kansas State Wildcats are the three seed in the East. They were picked to finish last in the Big 12. Instead, a third-place finish, 11 wins in Big 12 play, led to this NCAA tournament appearance, 23-9 and nine overall on the season. Great first year for Jerome Tang, the head coach at Kansas State. Who do they get? Out of the big sky, they get the Bobcats of Montana State, 25-9 and nine on the year. They make it consecutive NCAA appearances for the first time in school history after knocking off Northern Arizona in the Big Sky Tournament. Now, first and second round games in Columbus, Ohio on Friday and Sunday. The Spartans of Michigan State, Tom Izzo, now reaching the NCAA tournament record setting 25th straight time. They finished fourth in the always tough Big Ten. They are the eighth team out of the Big Ten Conference. They will meet the Trojans 
of USC from the Pac-12. Trojans finished tied for second in the Pac-12 with 14 wins. And that's our last bubble team and the fourth from the Pac-12. Very respectable showing. Now, last two slots to be filled in the East. Marquette's Golden Eagles, fifth team out of the Big East. Coach Shaka Smart, Big East Coach of the Year, leads the Golden Eagles to back-to-back -to -back NCAA tournament appearances. They were picked to finish ninth in the conference. A little better than that, 28 and 6 overall and 17 and 3. Good, strong two seed for the Big East champions. That's a good seed for them. And they will meet the Catamounts of Vermont, 23 and 10. These Catamounts are a staple in the NCAA tournament. At least a share of the American East regular season title in each of the last seven seasons. They are the 15th seed in the East region. All right, let's refocus our attention to the top of this bracket. Seth. Yeah, first of all, just to be clear, that 16th seed is Texas Southern against FDU. Uh, two very dangerous double-digit seeds here in FAU and Oral Roberts. I do like FAU to beat Memphis. I think Duke's playing too well. The upset pick here is Louisiana over yeah, Tennessee. Good call. Good call there, Tennessee overseeded because of their record, but they don't have their point guards to Kai Ziegler. Louisiana wins that game. Yeah, I like that. They've got Jordan Brown, a big guy who can get it done inside. They've got tremendous perimeter players around them, and they can put the ball in the basket. It'll be a tough matchup for Tennessee. Let's go down to the bottom of the bracket, Jay. I look at this Kentucky-Providence game. Bryce Hopkins, Providence's best player, yeah. came from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But also, these two teams had high expectations and really had good years, but their fans are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I think both of them can, one of them, the, the one that gets past this game, I think can get to the Sweet 16. Yeah, okay. and Marquette looks really strong to me. They, they're playing at such a high level. And Tyler Kolick, their point guard, has been one of the best players in the country the last month and a half. And that team is well-connected, explosive, a lot of versatility offensively. Well, I tell you what, it looks like they've got a pretty good pathway to get to that next level. All right, let's break down the conferences now that earned multiple bids. It looks like this. Nine conferences received multiple bids. The Big Ten and the SEC lead the way with eight teams apiece followed by the Big 12 with seven bids. We turn our attention to the last four teams that made the tournament. And the first four teams that were left out set. A team left out that you feel should have made it? And if so, who would you take out? Look, I had uh, Rutgers in the field, but um, they had four quad three losses, so that's why they were out. Uh, Oklahoma State is... All right, Creighton fans, it's official. We are heading west. We're going to let it fly in the mile high for the 15th time in the last 25 years. 24-time overall, the Creighton Blue Jays will be part of the NCAA tournament field. A record of 21-12, and 12. Creighton is dancing. It's going to be Friday in Denver, and we're playing NC State. A huge thank you to all the fans with your support. Creighton men's basketball ranked sixth nationally in average home attendance with more than 17,000 fans per game. All of you were there. At this time, we're going to have a couple players come on up. Ryan Kalkbrenner. And Baylor Shireman, come on up, guys. Say a few words. So first off, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, just excited we get to play in the tournament this year, and hopefully a lot of you can come support us on that. Look to make a deep run this year. You know, I think we got the team to do it. Uh, it'll be fun. <clears throat> yeah, just piggybacking off what Ryan said. Thanks for everybody coming out. Um, we're excited to be playing in Denver. You know, kind of close to Omaha. Um, hoping we know you guys are going to come support. Um, go Jays! All right, thank you guys. Good luck. Finally, the head coach of your Crane Blue Jays, Greg McDermott. Come on up, Coach Mac. Congrats. All right. Thanks. Yep. Never gets old, that's for sure. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, during the pink out over the course of the last 12 or 13 years, and especially the last five or six as we uh, got co construction going of the Hope Lodge, and then we've continued to pour that money uh, you know, into the Hope Lodge to keep it functioning on a yearly basis. And uh, the, the pink out's gone great. Today, we're fortunate to have one of the residents, current residents at the Hope Lodge, uh, Joy, Joy Arnold from Gearing, Nebraska is here. So Joy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, 
And she's got her daughter, uh, Andrea, and her grandson, Rylan, here with her today. But uh, Joy's been at the Hope Lodge since November. Uh, so, you know, we talk about it every year, how it's having an impact on people. And uh, I'm glad Joy could join us today so that we see that the impact is real uh, as we continue to, to have that event be one of the, one of the most fun things that we do uh, in the wintertime here in Omaha. But first of all, I'd like to thank my coaching staff uh, support staff. They've done an incredible job this year. Obviously, we had some rough waters there in December for, for four weeks or so that we had to get through, and going to work with those guys every day uh, made it easy to navigate that. Um, I'd like to thank Marcus Blossom and his staff for the support uh, throughout the season uh, to allow us to be in a position uh, to, be, to be successful and to be one of the better teams in the Big East. Um, and then, of course, uh, these guys right here. Uh, you know, their ability to stick together during some tough times uh, showed a lot about their character. Uh, they never, ever pointed fingers at each other uh, when things were tough. Uh, they stayed with the process. They believed in the process. Um, and we were able to turn around kind of a tough time uh, and, and end up finishing third in the Big East and then getting to the semifinals for the fifth time in, in nine years in the Big East tournament. And then lastly, thanks. Go ahead. Yeah. It's incredible to play in Madison Square Garden at the Big East Tournament, but we're used to it because we get to play in front of a full house every night uh, here in Omaha. So, uh, you know, what you guys do with your continued support of us, um, you know, we've led the Big East Conference in attendance every year we've been in the league. Uh, in some ways, it still sounds a little strange to say Big East Conference because of where we started. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the Big East has been terrific for us. And we've been terrific for the Big East in large part because of you folks and the passion that you have uh, for the Blue Jays and our athletic department. Uh, you were loud and proud in New York City, like always, and, and we hope uh, we didn't quite get Des Moines, which is the closest, but we got the second closest. So uh, Denver is going to be a great time. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one more round of applause. For the Creighton Blue Jays. Fans, we are not done yet. Be sure to stick around uh, when the women's basketball team find out where they are going. The selection show is going to get underway at 7. Be sure to scan the QR code for your chance to win some of the great prizes we have for you tonight. We've got tickets to a home game, a foursome at the Players Club, a $100 gift certificate to DJ's Dugout. We're going to announce the winners during the women's selection show later on this evening. you got to be present to win. Thanks again for coming tonight. We'll see you in Denver. Go Jays! We're going to stick around here on 1620 The Zone TV. We will be here for you for the next uh, hour or so. We're going to bring over a couple of the guys to talk to us. Mason Miller's going to join us here in just a moment. Because, uh, Mason, go ahead and grab that microphone right there. You know Denver, Colorado, maybe, don't you? Yeah, Do you remember thing, Denver? I know a thing or two about that. You sure, remember yeah. Denver? Yeah. Let's, uh, we're going to switch the camera view over here so we can uh, take a look at your handsome face. But uh, your dad played for the Nuggets. Yep, yep. And now you're going to Denver. How does that, I mean, how does that feel when you see your name called? And it happened early. Yeah, it did happen early. Oh, yeah, I actually already talked to my dad about it, too. Uh, I said we're going to Denver, and uh, he was watching it for sure. And uh, one thing he did say is be ready for the uh, different atmosphere change. So, you know, we're getting a little, a little higher up, you know. So it'll be interesting how it's going to be. I know the experience in New York. You didn't go as far as you wanted to, but just talk about what that experience. What was it like? The Villanova game, the Xavier game, and what do you think it means now heading into the NCAA tournament? Yeah. So uh, I mean, we all, we always had a really good uh, a really good high at first, but then. Uh, uh, low, low in the second game, you know, he didn't play as physical as we normally would or uh, how we normally would play. But, I mean, I think we kind of needed that, you know, a little, little adversity right there. So, see if we can uh, really come back to that, see if we can uh, retaliate and do good. Your role has really developed over the course of the year. We've seen a few more minutes here as we've gotten deeper in the season. Just tell us about, you know, how how your role has kind of changed over the course of the year. and. And you're starting to get your shooting touch back as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, really, it's just, just staying in the gym. You know, I, I keep uh, keep working out and then keep talking to the coaches. I mean, 
Uh, if you ever really like doubt yourself, you know, it's, it's going to not ever end out well. So, I mean, I just kept uh, staying on the course and staying positive, and it's, it'll work out eventually. And for those of you who still aren't familiar, Mason's dad, of course, Mike Miller, longtime NBA star. You talk to him often. Yeah. What was what was his words of advice for you as this season wore on? Because this was your first real chance to get a taste. You know, you redshirted last year. This was your first real chance to to dig in. How? What kind of advice did he give you throughout the course of the year? I mean, mo- mostly just to stay positive, and you'll always get your time. Because I mean, he's he's gone through this the same the same as me, so he knows he knows about this just like me. So it was really just stay positive and just uh, just stay the course. And it'll always end out well. So now headed out to Denver, NC State. Do you know anything about the Wolfpack? Did you do any advanced scouting? We we had a long flight home. Did you Um, you surf around a little bit? um, A little bit. I didn't, I mean, didn't do that much scouting, but I heard they got a pretty good big man, so we'll have to see. Yep. Well, I know you're looking forward to that. There's a chance to play Baylor as well out there. So good luck and uh, go get them and uh, give them a good scout because that's a big part of your role as well. Thank you very much. Mason Miller joining us here. At our tableside area as the uh, Blue Jays now mingling with some of the fans. And uh, Mason's going to get his picture taken with a few of the fans here. Now, again, we're going to stay with you. This line's going to stay open here for the next uh, probably uh, hour, hour and a half because the women's selection show is still coming up here live at DJ Sokol Arena. So a chance for the folks to uh, to see um, what's going to happen with the women's selection bracket just as the Jays were kind of projected to be a seven, I kind of thought they were going to be a seven, but then the six line came up. Certainly a, a, a pleasant surprise. And the fact that they get Denver as a destination, it's not De- Des Moines, as Greg McDermott mentioned, but it's about the next best thing. And quite honestly, the Jays haven't been to Denver for quite some time. So, And I think Mason brought up a good point. You sometimes forget, yeah, there's going to be an element of uh, getting used to the atmosphere and all that other stuff. But... Um, when you get when you get a chance to uh, to play in all of that and and move on, we can uh, you, you get a chance to uh, to really get used to it. And I think they're going to be okay over here. I think we, we'll see if uh, Marcus Blossom's going to join. He's been dying. He's, you, you've been dying to join me all year long, and now you bow out. Marcus Foster or Marcus Foster, Marcus uh, Blossom, athletic director, has been a little bit under the weather, but. He'll join us at some point. Instead, we'll get a much more handsome individual to come over here, Jalen Courtney Williams. No trouble. Assistant coach. You see your name up there. You see NC State. Do you guys have anything on NC State early on, or no. was that one of the teams you maybe thought you were going to play? No, actually not at all. Um, but obviously coming out of an ACC league, that's pretty tough. Keith has done a really good job this year, so we're about to hit the film room now and uh, see what we can dig up. I'm always curious because, you know, I, I kind of did a little advanced work, you know, which teams they might seat up with. What was the, what was it like for you and the coaching staff? Were you trying to kind of guess who you were going to play and then, you know, guys were start to pick apart, you know, which scout they would take? Yeah, as much as you could going into the Big East tournament, you kind of try to figure out where you'll land. But it's, it's, it's so hard to, to figure out where those dominoes or, or the Rubik's Cube will place you. Uh, but now we know, and, and there's a lot of work to be done here in the next few days. So how's the how are the assignments going to be divvied up? Obviously, we know Coach Huss is the offensive coordinator. We know yeah. Coach Miller's defense. Yeah. But then when you look ahead, because you've got Baylor and UCSB on the other side of the bracket, how's all the assignments going to be divvied up amongst well, the rest? I'll tell of the you assistants? what. Thankfully, we, we have a large um, a large staff with a ton of experience between Coach Murfield and and, and Casey um, Vanderloo and then the rest of us assistants. So so we have enough hands on deck to to figure some stuff out. Do you know what your first assignment's going to be? NC State. Yeah. So, so you're going to NC State. Yeah, we're getting right to it. We're getting right gonna to it. Going to get right to it. Um, this team, how they played, it was such a such a difference from the Thursday game to the Friday yeah. game. What do you think took place? What do you think happened? You know what? We, we we don't make a lot of excuses in our program, but you have to think the midnight finish had, had something to do with it. Uh, obviously, an emotional night and then finish at midnight. Uh, the next day was kind of funky. Um, but you know, Xavier played great. Xavier played great against us. And, and, uh, you know, I think they fell flat a little bit, uh, in their, in their next game as well. So it just kind of, sometimes that's the, that's the, that's the draw. It must be something about you play your best game in the garden and then you come back and you lay a, lay a clunker the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause that's what seemed to happen. Again, you talk about the emotions of the night and then the late finish, it, it takes a while to decompress. 
from games like that. And, we, you know, I, by the time I looked at my watch, there's still minutes on the clock. You know, it was 12.03. You know, I was like, man, this is late. And, again, you get to the hotel, there's still, you know, a few hours for you to decompress. Um, it was just it was a different kind of day, man. It was a different kind of day. Do you think there's going to need to be an adjustment to the altitude out there? You're playing in the Mile High City. Yeah. Yeah, bro. And now, if you have a, a trick for it, let me know. I don't. But- <laughs> I've never broadcasted in my high city. I might pass out. No question. No question. We'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can and adjust uh, as quickly as we can. All right. Well, we'll let you get to it because you know you guys are going to be Bailey. Thanks a lot. Jalen Courtney Williams, Creighton assistant coach, joining us here table side as the uh, Blue Jays got their assignment. They are headed to see the NC State Wolfpack in the first round of the men's NCAA tournament. We are going to also go to the uh, press conference. So we're going to bring you the press conference as soon as that happens. A lot of the Jays are still mingling with some of the folks here. I see Coach Mack over here. Still a handful of the players are here. So with the Friday game, that means likely the team's going to depart on Wednesday. And I could already tell just seeing some of the faces here at Sokol Arena. I think there were some folks who were pretty excited to see the Friday draw. You get that extra day of rest, that extra day to prep here at at Creighton over at the Championship Center, which is right next door. It just makes it a lot easier for, for folks to, you know, get ready and, uh, and and just gives you that extra day to kind of decompress because it's been a long week. You know, the Jays left for New York City on Tuesday, and then, of course, they practiced on Wednesday, played on Thursday and Friday, and then we got back yesterday. Like I said uh, earlier, we got back yesterday at about 7 o'clock, local time. So even though the Jays didn't go the distance in New York City, the fact that they were there um, made it, it just made for a longer week. And so to just get that extra day to decompress. So they'll really get two really solid days of prep here in Omaha. And then it's going to be a short trip. And for NC State, you know, they're going to be flying a little bit further. So it'll be more to get used to. But that the, the, the factor of the altitude is going to be interesting because the Jays have not really played. I'm trying to think back in my memory. I've been calling games now for 10 years, and I can't think off the top of my head that we played any games in the Rocky Mountains in altitude. I suppose the closest would have been uh, BYU when uh, the Jays went out to BYU a few years ago for the NCAA tournament or for the NIT tournament. I should say, I think that's the only game I can think of off the top of my head that has been in the mountain time zone. And I don't recall there being a factor out there in uh, in Provo, Utah, but it's a little bit different when you're in Denver. Um, we'll see. It, it probably won't be as big a deal. Uh, Jeremy Anderson, who is the uh, head of, um, of, tr- of training for the Blue Jays, does an excellent job. They've got body monitors on all of these guys, and uh, they they monitor everything and they keep everything in tune. They know exactly what these guys have been taking in as far as food and drink and everything else. They can, they, they just, they have next level stuff when it comes to strength and conditioning. Ben McNair, the head trainer. These guys are really in tune. Yeah, I see him. See, he won't, he'll join me on camera, but he won't join me on microphone. Athletic director Marcus Blossom. But they, they will have a good game plan going forth. I guarantee you Jeremy is already working on it right now over at the championship center to get this team ready to go and to work out a game plan for how practice is going to go and and uh, and just exactly everything that's going to happen here over the, uh, the next few days. And again, two days here in Omaha, then a chance to go out to Denver. Again, typically the Jays will travel two days before the start of the NCAA tournament. Here in the side-by-side, you can see the uh, setup over uh, in the press room. The uh, coaches and most of the players have already departed. They're uh, already in route over there. So as soon as the press conference begins, we'll switch things over to the press conference, and you'll be able to hear the, uh, the questions and answers. And then, again, stay tuned because we're staying live for the Women's Selection Show, 7 o'clock tonight on ESPN. So with that said, we're going to move over to the press conference room now. I see Baylor Shireman and Trey Alexander. Thank you. All right. We got Trey Alexander, Trevor German, Baylor Shireman. We'll start with just coach, give us your overall thoughts, and we'll take questions for you. 
Well, it, it just uh, it, it never gets old. Um, it's Election Sunday and everything that goes with it. Um, and you're a fool if you take it for granted. <laughs> Because there's, you know, there's so many teams across the country where their season's over, um, and to be able to play in this tournament, um, it's as good as it gets. It's what it's what we work for. Um, it's what these guys dream of when they're growing up, and as coaches, it's it's what motivates you. Um, so to be a six seed, uh, I think speaks uh, to the strength uh, of the schedule that we played uh, and the strength of the Big East. Um, and you know, to be, you know, obviously Des Moines was closer, but. Uh, being able to get to Denver where a lot of our fans can get there by car if they need to. Um, I think we'll have a great following and, you know, obviously playing a really good team in, in, in North Carolina state that we'll learn more about tonight. Um, but, uh, you know, excited to be back in the tournament and ready to get to work. I know nothing. I, know, I mean, I know Kevin Keats, uh, but I, you know, you just, as a college basketball coach, you don't watch anybody else during the season. You watch yourself and you watch your next opponent, uh, felt a little lost, you know, today because there was really nothing to do. Cause I had everybody, uh, I'd watch both of our games from New York and you don't know who you're going to play. So today felt like kind of a wasted day, uh, sitting around with the TV on, but, um, yeah, you just don't. Uh, as a college basketball coach, you watch very little college basketball outside of of, of your job. Yeah, I feel like it had a lot to do with us just being able to handle a lot of adversity through the year. I feel like it showed the type of team we are. Like even though we had a rough, a rough uh, patch in the seat throughout the season, we were still able to come out in the best way that we could. And I feel like, uh, I mean, it speaks volumes just as us as a team and also for our coaching staff. So for us to be in the position that we that we are right now is still still great for us to even be here this year. I mean, like Max said, you can't take these moments for granted because a lot of team seasons are over now, so. Yeah, just kind of piggyback off what Trey said, you know, we really just like Coach Max said, stayed together throughout the throughout the, the trials we had throughout the season and, um, you know, learned from those mistakes and those trials and, and got better um, because of it. And um, now we get to play, you know, in the best tournament, you know, that, that, you, that you dream of playing when you were little and, um, you know, Regardless of what seed you are, it doesn't really matter now. You just got to take it one game at a time. So, Matt, can you get into the process a little bit of trying to learn about a team when you are starting from scratch? Well, my staff's over there right now. Uh, you know, uh, you know, gathering information. Obviously, there's a there's there's a lot of services that we subscribe to where we can get some of the analytical information. Uh, but now it's just a matter of downloading games and and watching games and you know maybe talking to some people that they've played. Um, you know, just to get an idea. Uh, but uh, you know, we have till Friday, so we get four days of practice, which will be good. Um, you know, it, it uh, you know Frank will give us maybe tomorrow a day to kind of work on ourselves before we really turn our attention to them. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's, uh, you know, a couple of the staff will really concentrate on North Carolina state. And then, you know, a couple of the guys will, will, will put their focus on Baylor and, and, uh, UC Santa Barbara, um, to get ready for that. So it's, uh, it'll be a long night tonight for our coaching staff as we, uh, you know, get ready for practice at three 30 tomorrow. Generally speaking, that's a great conference. You know they're going to be battle tested at least. Can you speak to that? that they're a legit team. Yeah, I mean, everybody in the NCAA tournament's a legit team. Uh, you have to be legit or you wouldn't be there. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, until I watch them a little bit, you you know, you don't really have a feel for is it a great matchup for us and whether it is or isn't, we're playing the game. So we'll have to figure it out. Um, but, you know, they've, it, it appears that they've, you know, they've really scored some points at times. Um, and, you know, the ACC's been one of the better basketball conferences year in, year out. Um, and, you know, that's not any different this year. Obviously, they had a they had a great season in that league, or or, or they wouldn't be in the tournament. You mentioned that tomorrow. You to focus on yourselves. Do you emphasize what went wrong in the Xavier game, or do you quickly move past it and just focus on other stuff? Uh, you know, I watched both games, the Villanova game and the Xavier game, and obviously there was we did some really really good things against Villanova, and at times weren't ourselves against Xavier, but Xavier had some to do with that. So you know, we we'll show some some film to the guys tomorrow of both games 
you know, things that when we were successful, why we were su successful and when we weren't, uh, here, here are the issues and here's what we have to try to fix. Um, so, you know, try to do the best job we can of preparing so it doesn't happen again. Sure, you had a couple good days down in that Fort Worth last year. How do you think that experience might help you this time around? What did, what did you get out of it? Okay. Uh, yeah, I feel like it had a lot to do with uh, the experience value. Like last year, I felt like I was going to a situation to where I had to grow up very quickly and like kind of, you know, play a role that I wasn't really used to playing. And so coming into this year, how we have our full team, I mean, everybody's healthy, how we want it to be. I just feel like it's going to make everybody's job a lot more easier because we've all, me, Art, I mean, called Brennan for a game. Most of the game, we were all there. We were all able to experience it. So for us to experience these things, and then, of course, Baylor was already there last year. So we have a team that's that's full of experience in March, and I feel like that's going to kind of help us in a lot of situations to where we won't get too high or too low because we know that things can go either way. So for us to have that experience is, is going to be big for us. Baylor, you mentioned getting to play at the tournament for South Dakota State, but what does it mean to you to be able to do it again and now who's <clears throat> Well, yeah, I mean, like coach said, you know, anytime you can play in this tournament, it's it's a blessing. And, you know, um, you know, I came to Creighton to, to get in the tournament and play and, and win a lot with these guys. And I'm really excited to, you know, um, be able to, you know, have this experience with this group. And, and we're hoping to, you know, make some noise. Yeah, I'm really excited for all of them. Obviously, Steve, but, uh, Lutz has won it back-to-back -back years, and D-Rock's been there a few times, and you know TJ's done an incredible job at Iowa State. Uh, Daniel Robinson at Cleveland State just missed, lost a one-point game in the championship game of his conference tournament. So, um, you know, I follow those guys throughout the season. Those are the you know the scores that you pull up at the end of each night and check out the box score and, and exchange text messages. Um, but you know, really proud of what those guys have done. Um, you know, when you're when you're in a league like Coach Lutz and Coach DeVries, where you have to win the conference tournament uh, to get in the NCAA tournament, now that's real pressure, and, and you know that takes in, that takes high-level preparation and focus. And I, obviously, um, you know those two guys have, have done a great job, and you know TJ's done an unbelievable job during his time at Iowa State, and um, you know he beat Baylor three times, so he'll probably get a phone call from me at some point. Trey, uh, obviously, you take a lot of your top program assignments in. I don't know if you watched it or not, but Tracor Leon Smith is one of those electric guards, kind of fits that both high level. Obviously, it's too early to you know, talk about the game plan, but what do you like about guard, shifty, crafty guys like that? Uh, I, I just like the the pressure of uh, having to guard the best player. I feel like when you're facing somebody that's obviously was a draft prospect in him last year, uh, you kind of kind of look forward to a matchup like that just to see how well that you match up against each other and you kind of want to take that you kind of want to see if you can come out on top and I mean for us to do for me to have a matchup like that and being able to guard the best players throughout the tournament I mean it's going to be just fun that's a, that's the only way that I can describe it I can't wait to compete against those guys and hopefully get to talk back and forth a little bit and you know just compete and Matt these two talked about it a bit but obviously most teams do six straight games wouldn't even be here as, as you reflect on the journey um to get here as, what, what do you think it, it, it you know, frankly, it's probably one of the more rewarding things that's happened during my coaching career because I, I haven't experienced it much. Now, we've had some teams that we were in a rebuild mode where we've lost some games, uh, <clears throat> but never a team that was in the top 25 or top 10, and then you lose six in a row, and then you fight your way back to the top 25. I mean, that's that's really, really hard to do. I'm not sure it's happened before. Um, but it, as I look back on it, you know, just the – the process that we went through and our ability to kind of not lose our cool and just just stick with each other uh, during that time. You talk about it all the time in the locker room, how important it is, but until it punches you in the face, you don't know whether you have a team that's capable of that or not. And, you know, fortunately, even though we have three sophomores on this team in the starting lineup, uh, we were able to stick together and, and grow together and fight together and, and eventually figure it out. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of them for that because it was, uh, you know, a lot of teams might have uh, might have packed it in in that situation. And, and we didn't. We kept on fighting. And, uh, you know, it, we lost six, six in a row and it's and we're a six seed. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. Last year, all the injuries, all the up and down, people doubting you. 
come back against San Diego State. Um, playing games with shorthanded this year, the losing streak, and kind of the doubt that you guys had to deal with internally, externally. Like, how battle tested do you feel as a group after all you've been through in two years? Uh, yeah, I feel like we're we're pretty battle worn. I feel like everybody on this team has, in some way, had to face adversity throughout the year. I feel like. Um, whether it was last year, R R two going out, or whether it was Calk Brenner, I mean, I just feel like everybody in this program has has had a moment where they've had to overcome something, and I feel like that as a whole brings us together even more because I feel like we all have that one thing in common. <coughs> I mean, like like we've said, for us to lose six six in a row and for us to be back at a point to where we can compete at the level that we can, that we wanted to compete at all year, I mean, it's it's a blessing, but also I feel like. Uh, we're one of those teams that people have to watch out for because we we've all we've take, taken losses and we've kind of grown and gotten better over the over the course of the year. So, Back up. one two game scenario. How much does and those guys both talked about it? The experience piece that you guys have. How much does that matter in a short spurt weekend? Yeah, I mean it helps. The the, the guys have been there before and and uh, you know really our starting lineup except for our two has played an NCAA tournament. Uh, Sharif's played an NCAA tournament. Farabella's played an NCAA tournament. So, you know, we have six guys that have done it. Uh, I think that that helps. It helps the preparation. It helps kind of temper the emotions uh, to make sure that the emotions are used to your favor, not to your detriment. Uh, so I, I think the fact that we've had guys that have been through it before, I think that helps in that regard. But it's still, you know, it's still the emotions run high because it's it's pretty cool when you get into that city and you you jump behind that police escort to go to the game. It's just uh, there's something about it. And, you know, I've, I've been blessed to do it a number of times and it's it still feels the same, like it's the first time every time. Um, and you know, even those these guys have played in an NCAA tournament, they're gonna they're gonna have those feelings again this year. For Trey and Baylor, what are your guys' feelings like right now? Is there excitement? Is there a little nerves because it's hard to prepare when you've never played a team before? Just what is going through your guys' head? Yeah, I'm just excited. Uh, you know, it's a it's a great time of year. Um, like Coach Mag said. <clears throat> When you're young, that you know you dream of playing in um, this tournament, and so I'm just looking forward to you know a great a great week of preparation, and then um, you know on Friday we'll get out there and you know uh, do our best. Uh, yeah, for me, I feel like uh, after I've already got a taste of what it feels like to be in the situation to play uh, in front of a crazy crowd and be in this type of atmosphere, I feel like it's kind of now at a point like where I want more than I did last year. So I feel like I'm gonna like the level of intensity and level of focus is going to be very different than it has all year. And I feel like it's what it's going to have to be. And I feel like each player has to come with a different type of mentality in terms of this week, in terms of us being more prepared and being more focused than we have all year. If we want to turn the, the goals that we have this year into reality. For, for training, man, obviously you guys play Maui and Texas, you guys play you know, teams out of conference, uh, you know, in these types of situations. I guess what, what's that process like for the, you know, all, all teams that, uh, yeah, I feel like it has a lot to do with us knowing tendencies and things like that. I feel like the coaching staff always comes with a great game plan. And for us, uh, we have to just follow through with that to be able to, uh, you know, know what type of player that we're guarding, uh, whether we have a team that we're playing the switching or whatever it is, whatever the case is, we just have to know what the tendencies are of each team and the players. And I feel like that that has a lot to do with our preparation. So for us to be playing a team we've never played before, I feel like, like I said, the preparation has to be, uh, we have to be pinpointing everything that we're doing because, I mean, now we can't make the same mistakes that we've been making the whole year or we won't be able to play anymore. I mean, yeah, I mean, he pretty much hit it on the nail there. I mean, the coaching staff does a great job with, you know, coming up with a plan. And then, um, you know, we obviously go over it a lot throughout our week of preparation. And then it just comes down to, you know, executing that um, come game time. Thank you. We'll see you in Denver. Thank you. All right. So there is the latest. Greg McDermott, Baylor Shireman, Trey Alexander reacting to the news and getting some of the questions from the press corps. It's a little bit past 6 o'clock Central Time. Actually, no. Yeah, it is 6 o'clock Central Time. 
I never did set my computer ahead, but the computer did it for me, so that's good. Otherwise, I would have forgotten. But, yes, it's just a little past 6 o'clock Central Time. We're a little bit less than an hour away from the Women's Selection Show, which will be on ESPN. We're going to stay right here and get you live reaction from the women's team when it happens. So we're not going anywhere for a little while. Before we get to kind of our halftime of uh, – of our broadcast here on 1620 The Zone TV. Just a little bit of a scout early on for NC State. They're led by Terquavion Smith, who's one of the best players in the ACC. He was third in the ACC in scoring this past year, averaging 17 and a half points per game. He's also 10th in the nation in field goal, three-point field goal attempts. So this is a guy who's going to shoot a lot of threes. You heard him ask, you heard Trey Alexander asked about him earlier on. This is a team that will shoot the three and shoot it a lot. They are 68th in the country in three-point field goal attempts per game, averaging about 24 per game. They make them at about 35% clip, so they're just a little bit behind Creighton, at least in terms of the three-point shooting percentage. The Jays are currently sitting at uh, just under 36% from three, so they're kind of similar in that standpoint. Tempo-wise, Creighton... uh, Play, doesn't play as fast as they have, at least according to the adjusted tempo from Ken Palm. But NC State is top 90 in the country in adjusted tempo. They're 55th overall, according to Ken Palm. Offensively, they're better than they are defensively. Ken Palm has them at 85th adjusted defense, 36th in adjusted offense. They tend to play higher possession games, higher scoring games. Wolfpack, under head coach Kevin Keats, gives up 78 points a game and just a skosh under 71 points per game allowed. It is a team that does not turn the ball over a lot, and that's going to be important for a high-possession game, a high pace game that we might see. A team that doesn't turn it over a lot could be a big advantage for NC State. Their, their turnover margin is 16th best in the country. They average plus 3.8 better on the turnover side. So in other words, the opponents turn it over nearly four time, or four more times per game than do the Wolfpack. But the give and the take with this team, again, is with the offense comes a little bit less in terms of defensive efficiency. As we mentioned, they're 85th in Ken Palm, but they give up 44% from the field. That's 218th in the country. Their three-point defense is actually not too bad. They're top 85 in the country, 32% from three. Next to Smith in the backcourt, Jarkel Joyner, fourth in the ACC in scoring. So Smith and Joyner are three and four in the in the ACC in scoring. Smith averaging 17 and a half points. Joyner averaging 17.1 points. Joyner, the point guard, is third in the ACC in assist to turnover ratio and is a good three-point shooter or, excuse me, free throw shooter as well. So that's a little bit of a scouting report on the Wolfpack. It's a team, too, that will try to get its points in fast break situations, they're seventh in the country in fast break fast break points. So again, that goes back to the turnover margin. Jays are going to have to be very careful taking care of the basketball. NC State averages nearly eight steals per game, which helps that plus side turnover margin. And they turn those turnovers into points, 15 points per game in fast break points. That's seventh best in the country. So it's a team that can turn you over. Jays are going to have to take care of the basketball. We obviously saw in the first half, especially against Xavier on Friday night, what happens when the Jays are not careful with the basketball. It was one of the big factors that allowed Xavier to pull away in the first half and, of course, end up with that 22 point victory on Friday night. NC State this past season finished in the middle, uh, middle of the pack in the uh, Atlantic Coast Conference this season. The uh, the Wolfpack, I believe, were sixth this year. Yeah, sixth place, 12-8 and eight overall. They actually finished a game ahead of North Carolina, three games back of Virginia for first place. They were 23-10 and 10 overall. And just taking a look at some of their metrics this year, it was a team that went 4-6 and six on the road, 4-2 and two in neutral site games. Their strength of schedule this year, they ended up 37th in non-conference RPI. So their strength of schedule was pretty good overall. Of course, when you're playing the ACC, 
that tends to be uh, that tends to be a factor there. They were only one in six though against Q1 competition. The Jays went three and eight this year against Q1 competition. You may have heard Seth Davis and the boys on the uh, CBS set talk about how NC State was one of the last teams in to the tournament. But when you look at some of the teams they played this year, they lost a neutral site game to Kansas. They lost to Duke, Virginia, and Miami. They actually beat Duke in a home game in Raleigh on uh, January the 4th. That's their one Q1 win this year. They actually thumped Duke at home 84 to 60. Their worst loss of the season, they did not suffer any losses in quadrant three or quadrant four. Their worst loss of the season was to Syracuse, but that was on the road. So that actually goes into the uh, Q2 bucket in terms of uh, how it's sorted by the NCAA. Connor Happer is going to join me here for a little bit, and we'll take a quick break here in our coverage. But uh, Connor was back in the press conference room. And uh, Connor, going to Denver, I mean, that's not a bad choice, all things considered. I know at the beginning of the season when the when the expectations came out and you saw that, you know, Creighton had some high expectations, and then you saw where the brackets were. They were hoping for that Des Moines to Kansas City trip. But all things considered, going to Denver is not a bad consolation for us. No, I mean, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be pretty blue, I imagine. I mean, you just saw it in Madison Square Garden. They don't mind making that trip. They probably don't mind making a trip to Denver either. I, I, and it's the it's the second best possibility as far as location. And then you look at the draw, too, and it's so hard because you don't know exact, you don't know anything about these teams. But, I mean, it looks to be a nice little setup for them fans-wise and then with the teams that you're playing as well. I, I mean, that was my first thought that came through my head when I saw it. I'm like, this is this is kind of a nice deal. You're not going across the country or anything like that. Creighton fans will follow anywhere, but to to, to take them to Denver, it's a pretty good deal. And it's a drivable trip. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't, you know, if, if you don't want to try to catch a late flight, drivable trip, easily, and plenty of places to stay out there. And of course, there's some Jays fans who've probably been out there before for other sporting events. So yeah, I think I think it's a really good draw. But it's it's so fascinating when you look at this bracket, Connor. They haven't played NC State since 2016, but on the opposite side of the yep, ladder there they are, are two teams that they have played in the NCAA tournament. The three-seed Baylor was the team that knocked them out in 2014, and the first team they beat in route to the Sweet 16 two years ago was Cal State Santa Barbara. So no matter who they see, it's going to be a familiar face. It won't be a lot of the same players, well, obviously, but it'll be some familiar faces. Absolutely. I mean, to the Baylor thing, I mean, that still brings up memories with people around here. Oh, God, yes. Um, And then you go down a little further, there's Arizona. And there's Arizona. So there's there's some familiar faces in that thing, um, and you got to like the way that <laughs> sort of that feels a little bit. I mean, you can find as much familiarity as you want. You know, I haven't seen Baylor. You haven't seen UC Santa Barbara since a long time ago. But uh, we try and find anything, any little thing. Max said before when we were just talking to him in the press conference, um, you know, a lot of what I think they do initially, they're going to call some other coaches. I know NC State played Butler this year. So they'll they'll call, you know, and ask around and see what they can get out of just little tiny things here and there and how to guard them, what to do against them. Yeah, they beat Butler earlier this year on a neutral floor. 76 to 61 so that's one common opponent that they have and i'm just kind of scrolling the rest obviously there's not a lot of crossover between those schools but yeah butler certainly is one so they can get a scout there and it's so much easier these days with all the video that is shared on the services that they use they can pull down clips i guarantee you casey matthews was probably spending the last 12 to 18 hours just trying to figure out all right which teams do we need and now he's in the business of trying to sort everything out. The good news is the Jays have a big support staff between you know, all the assistant coaches, Casey, everybody else in that department. So my, my guess is by the end of the night, they're going to have a yep. pretty good idea of you know what they're going to have in terms of information and the fact that this is going to be a Friday, Sunday instead of a Thursday, Saturday, I think also helps the Jays because you know it was a long trip to New York. Now they come back. They've got a couple of day, couple more days to decompress here before having to go off to Denver. Well, Mac talked about it a little bit there, too. Um, he said today felt like a little bit of a waste of day. He was watching some other teams, watching some other results come in. Wasn't anything to prepare for yet. So you you know, you know, sort of go through today, and it's and it acts as, I mean, a complete day off. I mean, really, there was no activity today at all. So then you get to work tomorrow. You put in the game plan sort of tonight. The coaches were already working when, you know, right when they got the selection. 
Um, so you, you get, and then you get that extra day on the back end too, where you get the Friday Sunday deal. Um, so I mean, it sets up pretty well, but you know, it's a it's a one game scenario, it's a two game scenario, and you, you know, you you do the best you can. Any other thoughts on the rest of the bracket? Any surprises to you? I was kind of, I mean, I know that Providence was sliding towards the end of the season, but I was a little surprised that they were uh, they were as close to the bubble as they were. Yeah. Providence ended up an 11 seed against Kentucky. A lot of folks thought they were safely in the field, but that 11 seed indicates well, that they were right on the cusp. Let I me mean, go back to Creighton for a second, too. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people pegged them as a seven. You saw it on the bracket matrix coming in. And and I think yeah, only about 20 of the 80 some odd bracketologists still had them as a six. I, I think, you know, and you go back to that first when they debuted the top 16 seeds right away. And, and Creighton was one of the first two off of that 16. Obviously, they suffered a couple losses since then. But the committee thought really highly of Creighton. And I think when they look back at their six game losing streak, they really took into account that they were not 100 percent during that time. So, I mean, that's that was they were probably a seed higher than everybody thought they were going to be. And there's some great matchups out there, too. Everybody looked at Oral Roberts Duke right away. Duke's been playing really good basketball lately. Um, Oral Roberts has been the best, you know, low major in the country for a couple of years. Yeah, now. Asmus against Duke's going to be really yeah, funny. Yep, it's going to be really good. So, I mean, and then you look at we were talking about locations. I mean, Des Moines, I think, has Arkansas and Illinois. Those are two fan bases that travel really, really well. Um, I think there was a couldn't remember who else was in uh, well, Des Moines. The other one that I thought was interesting was UConn. UConn Iona. UConn Iona, yeah. because all the rumors right yeah. now are that Rick is that Rick Pitino is the number one choice at St. John's. Though Texas Tech is also looking at him. I mean, Rick Pitino going up against UConn, and I was I, I just happened to glance at Twitter during the selection show, and I could see a few UConn folks were a little quizzical about that. They thought that four seed was just a little bit low. And that's a tough group there, too. St. Mary's is great. VCU, we know their history and how they play. That's a really tough four, you know, 5-12, 4-13 there um, to sort of get out of. U- UConn's obviously the favorite with their seating, but they're going to have to earn it to get out of there. That's that's certainly an intriguing one. Um, there's going to be... I thought Marquette, Marquette, that run they made in Marquette New York. Marquette is a two. That got him up there. Not, there weren't a lot of people that were going to yep. give him a two seed, but they got a two, and I think they deserved it, especially what they showed and i think that is a bracket that they can certainly come out of you know that group of kentucky and providence in the 611 k state montana state i think of all the teams that have a good shot of making it out of their bracket and making a deep run i think marquette's got a pretty good draw i think so too and then you look at the one seeds um you know kansas alabama purdue and uh the other one is uh, houston houston i mean I, this has kind of been the year of college basketball where nobody's nobody's taken claim to that number one overall team in the country. I think Purdue sort of occupied the spot the majority of the year. They've slipped at least a little bit, even though they won the Big Ten championship today. So, I, you know, there's there's a lot of room for opportunity for for somebody outside of that top group that we're not expecting to make a run. And then it's, you know, all about matchups and see what you get. So, again, the Jays are a six seed headed uh, to Denver to take on NC State on Friday. We should be getting some matchups or some times, times yeah. probably within the next. Oh, I would guess. I, I think to recall last year, it may have come in around eight o'clock. It wouldn't yeah. surprise Pretty me quick. If, if we saw it at some point during the women's selection show. So, I would say sometime before bedtime tonight, we'll have game times of when that will be. And remember, you're in the Mountain Time Zone, so it'll you'll, you'll later. Have a, it'll be a little bit later. Yeah. So, an hour later here. Omaha time, but you know, either way, I think it's, I think it ends up being a pretty good draw, all things considered. I think we saw the benefit of the tough schedule this year, playing all those quality opponents. I think, you know, even though it may have also exacerbated the six game losing streak when Brian Kalkbrenner went down, I think it ended up paying dividends because for the Jays to finish, you know, with 11 losses this year, but still, or excuse me, 12 losses this year and still end up a six seed. I think that's a credit to the schedule and the quality of play that the Jays had throughout the course of the season. Well, and, and the Big East was really, I mean, you know, it, even though it wasn't as deep as some of the other conferences right. out there, five teams at the NCAA tournament and they're, you know, with the exception of Providence, they're all top six seeds, right, in the tournament. That's so, right. I mean, that that matters a lot. You played a tough conference and you played a really, really tough non-con. So you're battle tested that much is like internally, if you're looking at it that way. And that's obviously how the committee sort of viewed it as well. Like I said, I mean, they they clearly liked liked Creighton the entire sort of time. And I, I would have been really curious to see what would have happened 
if they would have won two more games at Madison Square Garden um, because I think there's a chance they could have popped all the way up in that top four range. But um, it's a you know it, it's it's a good setup for them and and they're certainly battle tested and they're and they're experienced. That's another thing we were talking about in the in the press conference with those guys too. Everybody everybody in their starting five has started a tournament game with the exception of R two. Um, so it's a it, it's that's what you want going into the tournament. That doesn't tell you the entire story. It doesn't guarantee you anything. But it's um it's as good of a setup as you can get. Connor, thanks for coming over and joining me. We're going to take a little bit of a break in the action. We're going to keep the line open for everyone. So the feed's not going anywhere, but we'll go radio silent, at least for, oh, probably the next 30 minutes or so. But then the women's selection show is coming up on ESPN. That will be at 7 o'clock Omaha time, 7 o'clock on ESPN. So if you want to watch along, we'll have uh, all the reaction from Coach Plan and the players as Creighton's women find out where they are headed in the NCAA tournament. They were also projected in that seven-seed range. We'll see if the Jays' women, who also played a good schedule this year, get a little bit of a bump uh, in the uh, in the tournament as well. I think that would be awesome if both teams could end up with a six-seed. I'm guessing they'll probably end up with a seven. But, um, but yeah, it, it'll work out great. Uh, are they gonna, oh. Not sure what Rob's doing here. Oh, I'm not sure what Rob's doing either. <laughs> He's but looking at somebody else. Actually, I think he's calling Matt DeMarinas over. We'll talk, we'll, I'll talk with Matt a little bit. We'll, we'll keep it We'll keep it live here. We'll just keep the action going for a little bit longer. There's no problem here. We're kind of doing everything a little loosey-goosey today. I hope you're enjoying all the video coverage here on 1620 The Zone TV. And uh, thanks to Joe Willman and everybody here at Creighton for getting us such great quality pictures. Uh, if there's any mistakes with the graphics, those are on me. I'm in charge <laughs> of the graphics. Hey, it looks sharp. Of, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, do you, you like the little bracket thing Very I made good. there? Very good. Isn't that pretty? All on the fly too. Not well, bad. I had a template you had ready the template. to go, and I just had to plunk everything. It's called preparation. In. Let's bring Matt DeMarinas in for one Matt Blue review, and uh, have a seat, Matt. Have a seat, Matt. Matt DeMarinas, who does great work with White and Blue Review, the so official, the official website of the Blue Jays, the official, <laughs> well. Not the official website of the Jays, but I've been around for a minute. Yeah, been around for yeah. just a little bit. Were you surprised to see a six? No, that's what I thought. Actually, really? I thought both the men and the women were going to get six seats today. So you believe the women will get a six? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think they're going to get a six. I think my prediction is six seed versus Princeton at Notre Dame. So that's my prediction. But yeah, I thought the men. You know, just looking at the men, their predictive metrics were all like in the two, three seed line, and then their actual resume metrics were kind of in that 7-8 range, so I felt like the committee was going to split the difference there and give them a six seed, and that's kind of where I saw it landing. I thought they were going to play Drake in Albany just for storylines. See, I, I thought so, – I thought if they, well, I thought – Drake get, ended up going I, to Albany, but I not predicted 11, if they so. got a five, they would play Drake. Yeah. So I'm yeah. happy to see it at a six. I'm glad Drake sent – we don't for have to sure, worry about for Drake. For sure. Yeah, I like Drake's draw too, so. But, yeah, that's what I thought it was going to be, Drake and versus Drake in as a 6-11 in, in, in Albany, so. This is an NC State team that will get up and go. They'll try to turn you over. They're one of the top teams in turnover margin this year. Jaquavion Smith, Jarkel Joyner are their top two guards. Yeah. I, I don't know how much of NC State you saw this year, but of, of what you know, what do you think of the matchup? Well, it, I mean, to be honest, the ACC of the conferences was the least, the one I watched the least. Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised. They got, four, they got four bids, right? Like, I'm surprised yeah. by that. So, uh, um, I just know Kevin Keats' style, like – they're going to press you. They're going to try to turn you over. They're going to try to create offense with their defense. Uh, that's really all I know on the surface of them. I'll obviously watch like a few of their games tonight and kind of get a better feel for it. So, sorry, I can't go too no, in depth on the answer well, there. But yeah. I know Kevin Keats' style is to, you know, the pressure defense, create offense with their defense, uh, manufacture it that way. So, that's going to be ball security coming off of a, a rough outing against Xavier is going to have to be a priority. It would have been anyway, but it's going to have to be more so because of NC State style. Well, we saw that. We saw that on Friday night. I mean, 11 turnovers yep. in the first half, and really that was – that's what really sparked Xavier to yep. get out to that big lead. And, you know, by, even though the Jays cleaned up their act in the second half, the damage had kind of been done. Yeah, it was it was a pretty significant stretch of, of poor ball security. Um, you, I don't think they're going to be able to afford to do that against NC State because it's going to allow NC State to get really comfortable – that's kind of how they normally play and how they get kind of into a rhythm is when they know they can make you sweat every time they have the ball in front of you, essentially. Uh, it gets in your head and it gets them confident. So, uh, yeah, you, going into the tournament, you felt like the days that Creighton was going to spend working on themselves 
we're going to be prioritizing ball security. It, like I said, it's going to be more so now, knowing that a they just had a bad game of it themselves, and b their opponent is going to thrive off of it if they don't shore it up. So, momentum. We talked about it at the end of the regular season. They had built up a couple of nice games, and then they went out and played a great game, maybe one of their best games of the year against Villanova, and then it yeah. completely went south against Xavier. Now, I, I mentioned it on the radio broadcast at the end. Keep in mind, the Jays' best tournament run in the modern era came on the heels of the blowout loss to Georgetown. So how much do you think Friday night will impact Creighton in terms of their mental mindset going in to, to Friday? It, it, I'll, can they, is it a flushable game? Yeah, I'll make the I'll make the argument for zero. And the reason I'm going to say that is because you see teams kind of come out of nowhere, and once they get to hit that reset button, and they the the confidence you derive in this tournament is built off of the, the first game you play. And I feel like if Creighton can get their swagger back in this opening game, that's a springboard, and it won't necessarily they'll put Xavier completely in the rearview mirror if they play well against NC State. So that's why kind of like that's what the tournament provides teams. If you flame out in the conference tournament, it doesn't necessarily help you in the NCAA delays. As and, and on the same token, if you rip through your conference tournament, I mean, Iowa comes to mind last year. They tore through the Big Ten, and then they got worked over by Richmond. So it's like you're only as good as what you're what you are on that day. So momentum, I guess, would be nice in the sense of it probably gives the team a lot of confidence. But I think the only teams that really have a a, a high level of swagger going into this tournament themselves are the teams that have been ripping through for two, three months. So like your one seeds, your mid-majors that have had um, good conference seasons. Uh, for teams like in Creighton's range, you really just build momentum off of your next game. So that's the priority there. Uh, learn from Xavier in terms of what you guys did right and wrong in the controllable areas for Creighton is going to be a priority. And then flush it because the next opponent doesn't care how you played a week ago. So you have to forget about it. One more thing, and let's talk women before we hear about their draw, which is about 30 minutes away, and we're going to keep the line open, and you'll be able to see the women's reaction and also hear from Coach Flan and some of the players here on 1620, the Zone TV. But two really hard-fought games at the conference tournament, the exciting finish against Seton Hall came up just a little bit short against Villanova. This is a team that's obviously intact from last year. Yeah. The great run, we're looking up at the banners right now yeah. of, of the uh, – the, the, the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight runs for this team. How much momentum do you think Flans Group has going into the tournament? Again, not knowing who they're yeah, going to play, right. but they they they're in a been there done that scenario. That's that. Yeah, that's the. I think this team's going to have a different dynamic because I think their momentum's gone because they had a week in between the conference tournament and their next. I mean, they got two weeks honestly in between the conference tournament and their next game. So last year they made the Elite Eight, like you said. And they came off of a disappointing one and done in the Big East tournament off of that. And they'd also lost on senior day. So they hadn't won in like three weeks and they went to the Elite Eight. So that's why I kind of say momentum is about your next game. I think with this team, it's going to be about handling pressure because now this upcoming week for them after they find out their assignment is going to be all about can you recapture the magic that allowed you to go on a, a multi weekend run last year? The, the pressure of that has hit them at times this year and they haven't handled it as well so that's going to be the priority is like just can you forget about the outside noise focus on basketball and do what you do because if you do what you do from a matchup standpoint they are a very unique team in the way they play like they're hard to prepare for in a short prep and the further they get in this tournament the more advantages they're going to have so that's the key for them externally internally they had a good practice yesterday uh they got to go up and down a lot against each other i think they're back in the mojo of you know, let's hoop now. Um, and they wanted this. They wanted this pressure. They wanted to have expectations going into March. They wanted to put themselves in a better position than they were in last year. So they checked all those boxes off, and now it's just about finding out their matchup and then going and play basketball. This is what they want. So, Well, make sure to watch for all of Matt's great coverage in white and blue review. Of course, Tom does a great job with the, uh, with the primer, and you guys will be covering both the men's tournament, the women's tournament, you know, you know where you're going. I'll be staying home. You're gonna stay yeah, home I'm and watch home. it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's easier that way. Yeah. I create a little hub for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have. You've yeah. done a pretty good job, you yeah. know. But all the great work over at White and Blue Review, and of course, you can join the message boards and uh, and chat with other Blue Jay fans in the Blue Jay Underground. Matt, really appreciate you coming. Thank over. you, sir. I appreciate you, you man. Matt, go Thanks. Cubs.
<laughs> Baseball season coming up. He's the Yankee guy. That's uh, Matt DeMarinas of White and Blue Review. So, folks are taking a little bit of a break. The women will be showing up. Some of the some of the folks are already here. Some of the uh, team is already here, ready to go. Looking forward to their selection for the NCAA tournament. You heard from Matt. He thinks they can get a six seed. He's picking six seed against Providence at Notre Dame. We'll see. We'll see if they're right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We're keeping the channel open, but stay right there. Have this up in the background while you're watching the women's selection show on ESPN, 7 o'clock straight up ESPN for the women's selection show, and then we will bring you all the reaction from right here at Sokol Arena with Coach Flan, with the players. We'll hear from them both at the podium and the press conference. So we're not going anywhere. More to come here on 1620 The Zone TV on this special Blue Jay Selection Sunday.
Incredible Elite Eight run last season, ladies and gentlemen. Flan is here, the head coach of your Blue Jay women's basketball, Jim Flannery. And now let's meet your 2022-23 great women's basketball team. A 5-10 freshman from Kansas City, Missouri, number two, Kennedy KT Townsend. A 5'8 freshman from Minneapolis, Minnesota, number 11, Kiani Lockett. A 6'1 freshman from Andover, Kansas, number 23, Brittany Harshaw. A 6'1 red shirt freshman from my hometown, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Number four, Lexi Unruh. A 5'10 junior from Omaha, Nebraska. Number 12, Jamie Horan. A six foot junior from Hastings, Minnesota. Number 14, Mallory Bray. A 5'10 junior from Lakeville, Minnesota, an all Big East first teamer, number 15, Lauren LJ Jensen. A 5'7 junior from Farmington, Minnesota, number 21, Molly Mogensen. A 6'1 junior from Crete, Nebraska. And all time, all Big East first teamer, number 30, more again, Molly. A 6'1 junior from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And all Big East honorable mention, number 31, Emma Runsick. A six foot senior from Topeka, Kansas, number 22, Carly Bachelor. Let's find out where Rachel's going to go. Finally, a 5'9 senior from Iowa City, Iowa, number 13, Rachel Flash Saunders. All right, France, fans, a big round of applause for your 2022-23 Crane Women's Basketball Team. The show is about to get underway. Let the madness begin. And welcome back to our special live coverage exclusively on 1620 The Zone TV. Earlier today, the Creighton men landed in the sixth seed in Denver, Colorado. We can now tell you what tip time will be in Denver. We just got word that the Blue Jays will tip off at 3 o'clock Omaha time Friday afternoon in the Rocky Mountains at Denver against the NC State Wolfpack. 1620 The Zone, of course, we'll have live coverage. Our pregame show from courtside will be at 2.30. And, of course, we'll also have Robbie Lula available as well for uh, pre extended pregame coverage here on 1620 The Zone. Of course, 1620 The Zone is also your home for the entire men's basketball tournament. But right now, the focus is on the women. And where the Jays end up in the big dance. Last year, the Creighton women with the stunning of Iowa and Iowa State advancing all the way through to the program's first ever Elite Eight in history. They returned so much back from last year's team, finished third this year in the Big East Conference, came up 
just a bit short in the Big East semifinals of the conference tournament last weekend against the Villanova Wildcats. But this is a team, as you heard maybe earlier in our coverage with Matt DeMarinas of White and Blue Review, this is a very experienced bunch who should come in with some momentum and certainly a lot of confidence because they have certainly been there and done that. So what we're going to have here for you over the course of the next hour or so, you will be able to see the reaction live from the Creighton women's team. You see them right there sitting front court, front and center as they're watching the big screen here at DJ Sokol Arena. And then as soon as the women's selection process is done, Coach Flannery will speak at the podium, and then Coach Flan and a couple of the players will head back to the press room, and we will bring you that press conference as well. So use this as kind of a, uh, a an accompaniment to watching the main broadcast of the bracket reveal on ESPN. ESPN's where to be for the women's bracket reveal. It starts here in about a minute, less than a minute, as a matter of fact. And then you can watch along here and hear direct from the players and the coaches and see their reaction when they see their name called here tonight. This is going to be the third time in the last 11 years that both the Creighton men's and women's teams have been in the tournament in the same year in back-to-back -back years. It's happened three times since 2011. There are a lot of programs in this country that can't claim that even once, but the Jays have now done it three times and it's the crossover period 2011 was the second to last year in the missouri valley conference so they've been able to do it three times in the last decade plus of both men's and women's teams advancing into the ncaa tournament together same season back-to-back -back years and it's going to happen once again this year so now it is time for the NCAA Women's Selection Show from ESPN. Watch along here on 1620 The Zone TV for all of the reaction from the players and the coaches here on 1620 The Zone TV. 36 at-large bids remain with 12 bubble teams waiting in angst. That empty bracket will be filled with 68 names. And when you find out with the rest of the world what your path to a championship looks like, you gather and you party. We've got cameras at over 60 locations as we find out together who is in. It's Selection Sunday. Y'all ready? Let's, Let's do it. Do it. Show. A season filled with will and intensity. Now, it all goes up a notch. The madness of March has arrived with a sense of urgency. The competition is fierce, but so are you. Strong drive. What a scoop. Give her the ball. You sacrifice your life for this game. What a play. That was nasty. The further you go, the hungrier you get. It's not how you start. It's how you work. And emotions will overflow. You're driven. You're strong. Right here is where you belong. There they are. The 12 members of the committee have been working, debating, examining enough data to make your head spin. Their work is complete for the 68 teams in the field. Their work just beginning. The goal, of course, to make it to the Final Four in Dallas and lifting up that beautiful girl right there in front of thousands of folks at the American Airlines Center. And it all starts right here. Officially welcome to the NCAA Women's Selection Special. I'll take this starting five over anybody. Well, in broadcasting, anyway, me and Charlie are kind of short. I'm L. Duncan. I'm joined alongside Andrea Carter, who spent... Her time with the Lady Vols appeared in two Elite Eights. Rebecca Lobo won a national championship with UConn. And my girl CP over here, the first and only Big Ten title, she coached Purdue to that back in 99. Charlie Cream, our resident bracketologist, who shockingly still has hair, despite the fact he should have been <laughs> pulling it out over some of these storylines. So before we get to the reveal, what are you most interested in? Who are the number one seeds? Okay. I think we have six teams that actually qualify, but there can only be four 
And I think it really comes down to that last one. Three teams we're looking at, Stanford, UConn, Iowa. I'm looking for who's going to be the bracket buster? Who is going to be the next great that was a 10 seed that pulled off the upset? They upset Colorado, Iowa, and Iowa State. Somebody's going to spoil the party this year. I'm really interested to see where Notre Dame lands, especially with the uncertainty surrounding Olivia Miles and her ability to play. Remember, when she went down, she was leading Notre Dame in points, rebounds, assists, and steals. When Notre Dame lost in the semifinals of the ACC tournament, they only scored 38 points. Which team are they? And my biggest thing when I'm looking at the storylines is the bubble teams. Which teams get in? Which teams were so close to getting in but just didn't make it specifically Oregon and Arkansas? Oregon, I know they have 14 losses, but none of them, in my opinion, are bad losses. Top 20 in the net. Top 20 in strength of schedule. Arkansas, they played LSU close. They've got the most top 100 wins out of the bubble teams. Will it be enough? to get in the tournament. That doesn't have to be rhetorical. We can actually answer that right now. Should we put some people out of their misery? I think we can start that. But first, a quick reminder, this year and how all roads lead to Texas, because they do, but we're getting there a little differently than normal. Only two regional sites this year, not four. We've got Seattle, Washington, and Greenville, South Carolina. The four teams that are left standing will then head to Dallas, Texas for the final four. Semis are on March 31st on ESPN, and we will crown a national champion on April 2nd on ABC. And with that, we are ready to reveal our very first region. We're calling this one Greenville One, and it starts with our number one overall seed. And folks, this might be the least intriguing thing. We, I think we all knew we were going to land here. Your number one overall seed, South Carolina, and deservedly so, undefeated. Well, they have the reigning national player of the year in Aaliyah Boston. They are on a streak of winning 38 games in a row. They are number one in scoring margin and, and rebound margin. So with South Carolina, what's going to be important for them is that they are the team that can only beat them. They've got to come in with that mentality. they got to be dominant from start to finish in every game. Of course, they feature Aaliyah Boston. As the one seed, they'll take on 16-seeded Norfolk State Spartans. Congratulations to the Spartans who are making their first tournament appearance since 2002. That's after getting their most wins in a season since the 95-96 season. We see you. I like the booth right. I like, I like sitting wings. in the booth. Everybody's go. eating. The yes. booth looks good. Relax. Yeah, they're ready. They're it's ready. a whole vibe. They are ready to go. All right, now for your 8-9 matchup in the Greenville region number one. We've got the South Florida Bulls taking on the Marquette Golden Eagles, who have 20-plus wins in six of their last seven seasons, but have never made it past the second round of the tournament. I see you, Bulls. Okay. Good setup. up. They're ready. Nice setup here. Okay. How about your 4-13 matchup as we continue in the reveal? UCLA Bruins at your four seed. They'll take on 13-seeded Sacramento, Sacramento State Hornets. You see UCLA here, their 18th NCAA tournament appearance, first since 2021. Look at the excitement. Got some dancing going on. Some here. dancing. Are we jumping in a boot because that's good. <laughs> Love that. And there's Sac State. Where's the dancing? We put, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Now they know. There's a little bit of a delay, and then they realize they're on camera, and they're like, let's show out. We see you, ladies. Congratulations. Is that an old school video camera? Did y'all see that? It looked like a little handheld camera. I think they had a Are you old enough there? to know about I, old school? I, listen, I'm coming up on 30. Don't sleep on me. <laughs> My best years are right here in these 30s. Don't sleep on that 5-12 matchup as we continue. We've got number five, Oklahoma, who will be facing number 12, Portland. There we go. The Sooners. Right, shooters shoot. Right, shooters shoot. Three point shooters. Second leading scoring team in the entire country, the Sooners. I've got my eye on them. A little up and down, but they can put it in the hoop. And how about those Portland Pilots? There we go. 23 wins, most of the season since 1996. They're looking for their first win in the NCAA tournament when they face Oklahoma. Congratulations, lady. All right. We now make it as we just finished up our Greenville top to the Greenville bottom regional bracket. We continue with the 314 matchup. That will be at number three, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, taking on number 14, Southern Utah. There we go. 
And this is the, the team that I, that is so curious to me and how they can perform. I'm looking for boots, Drea. And yeah. if anyone is We're dancing, all standing, everybody okay? Where, is everybody good? I said everybody stay seated. Yeah, yeah. nobody oh, stands no. up. Look, they're, they're laughing. They're laughing. They're laughing. They know. <laughs> Of course, we're referring to Olivia Miles and whether she'll be available. There's Southern Utah, them Thunderbirds. First NCAA tournament appearance. Congratulations to the Thunderbirds. They are dancing in Greenville. We continue on with our 6-11 matchup. At 6, we've got the Creighton Blue Jays, last year's Ooh. Cinderella team, if you will. And They'll be playing the winner of the play-in game, the Illinois Fighting Illini or Mississippi State. Yeah, Creighton, a team that is known for lighting up the three-point line. They could probably hit three sitting right there in those seats. <laughs> but talk to me nice, Sam Purcell and Mississippi State. That play-in game, I love it, but I also hate it. Shauna Green should be in the Naismith Coach of the Year conversation. Illinois, Mississippi State, that one's going to be a game I definitely have my eye on. Shauna Green's first season there in Illinois. And Come on now. Potentially dancing. We get you to the 215 matchup. Number two-seeded Maryland. The Terps will face the 15-seeded Holy Cross Crusaders. Subtle flex with the Terps. Yeah, and Maryland is one of the most improved teams throughout the course of this season. They are undersized, but they can rely on their length and athleticism on the perimeter. And you see those Holy Cross Crusaders. They're dancing for the first time since 2000. And seven, riding a six-game win streak as well. Go face the turf in the first round. We continue. We're just buzzing right along with our 7-10 matchup. Your seven-seeded Arizona Wildcats will be facing 10-seeded West Virginia Mountaineers. There we go. We see ya. The D Barnes crew, 10th NCAA tournament appearance. A team record fifth straight 20 win season. Of course, led by Kate Reese. They're their All-Pac-12 selection, and they're facing West Virginia in the first round. And that is your bottom. So we have revealed the first of four brackets. You guys ready? Okay, your biggest takeaway and you sort of, as we look at the top of the bracket, South Carolina and the path. Now that you've sort of seen what the rest of the bracket looks like, what are your thoughts as you digest? It seems like the committee does this every year. There's an interesting rematch of something that happened earlier in the year in South Carolina played UCLA early. UCLA was leading at the half. But here is the secret sauce that Don Staley has. When you get off starting slow, you have Aaliyah Boston, gives you a double-double, and then she can go get her a little Camilla Cardoso, gives her a double-double as well. And if this region goes chalk, what's interesting is the potential, another rematch, South Carolina and Maryland. This is the, a matchup that happened early in the season. Keep in mind, Diamond Miller didn't play in that game. Both teams are much improved since then, but in particular, Maryland really found their way as the season went on. And here's the thing, when I think about South Carolina and potential rematches, so far this season, though, They've been better against teams the second time around, right? They go to overtime against Ole Miss. They see Ole Miss the second time around. They dice up that zone like they're eating it for dinner. And then they see Tennessee. They see Tennessee the first time, win by 13. And then without Kiera Fletcher, they're able to beat Tennessee by 16. So those teams, UCLA, Maryland, anybody that's facing South Carolina the second time, get a little creative because they seem to be better the next time they see This them. is a team, when they get tournament time, they're on a mission. That's why they turn it they up. They turn it up. You got to get a little creative. You talk about their dominance. There's only been a handful of teams that have even kept the loss within single digits. Five games that have even kept it within single digits. You guys ready to reveal our next region? Ooh, ready? All right. Let's we'll go. stay with the Greenville region. Greenville 2 is what they're calling this. Again, because we've got two locations now for your regional. So... We will reveal our 116 matchup in the Greenville 2 region. Congratulations, your one seed goes to the Indiana Hoosiers. There they are. Ninth NCAA tournament appearance. Charlie, your thoughts on Indiana getting that this one is seed? A great offensive team. Mackenzie Holmes, one of the most efficient post players in the country, he shoots at almost 70% from the field. Grace Berger is just super, super clutch. Surround those two with a bunch of good shooters. And I think this Indiana team has Final Four written out all over them. They've had a great season, and they really never have an off night. A few minutes here or there, but they're very, very consistent. You mentioned Grace Berger. She came back for a fifth year because she said she wanted to do something big with this team, and here they sit. The one seed they'll face on Tennessee Tech, Golden Eagles, or the Monmouth Hawks. Monmouth making a lot of noise right now as well as we check in on Tennessee Tech. will be in that first four game for a chance to play Indiana as we get you ready for your 8-9 matchup in Greenville 2. Your 8 seed Oklahoma State Cowgirls. They'll be facing the 9th seeded Miami Hurricanes. 
We see you, cowgirls. They kind of all got in formation and stood at exactly the same time. <laughs> First 20 win seasons since 2017-18. And Miami, bienvenido a Miami. Just super jelly because it's definitely warmer wherever you are. Oh, look at all in shorts, all comfortable. <laughs> Miami's, exactly. had some, Miami's had some quality wins this season over tough opponents. The ACC was a really competitive conference. All right, as we continue in the Greenville 2 region, we look at the 4-13 matchup. Your four-seeded Villanova Wildcats will face 13-seeded Cleveland State Vikings for Villanova. Rebecca, their 13th NCAA tournament appearance, second straight. And this is a Villanova team you see that had six losses on this season. Three of those came in against Connecticut in Big East play. Of course, Villanova led by their senior, Maddie Segret. She leads the nation in scoring at just under 29 points per game. This young lady went off for 50 in a game against Seton Hall. On this season, she scored at least 20 points in every single game, every night, game plan geared to slowing her down. No one's been able to. How many, Rebecca, say that one more time? Against Seton Hall? How many? 50. Come on, 50. Wow. And shout out to Cleveland State, their first 30 win season in team history, just the third Horizon League team to win 30 games. You ladies will be dancing. Congratulations, as we will see you in Greenville. Your 5-12 matchup as we continue Washington State Cougars facing the Florida Gulf Coast University Eagles. I'm telling tell you, you better watch out for Washington State. They Biggest walk, fan here. Hey, they walk straight through that Pac-12 tournament. They are playing with a lot of confidence in Charlize Liga Walker. She is really shooting the ball well, distributing well. They go as she goes. You mentioned those Eagles and momentum, riding a 14-game win streak as they head into the tournament. That's the ninth longest active win streak in D1. So they've got momentum on their side, and they'll face Washington State in the first round. We continue with our Greenville 2. It's our 3 and 14 matchup. The third-seeded LSU Tigers will be facing the 14-seeded Hawaii Rainbow Wahina. LSU has got to really take a hard look at what happened in the SEC tournament. Can they bounce back? They have one of the best centers in the country in Angel Reese and a true point guard in Alexis Morris to get things going. And SEC freshman of the year, Flaje Johnson, can she get the flow going on the court as well as she does in the rapid studio? Bad Wi-Fi. That was a really dumb Okay, yeah, it was. We got to <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm kind of glad a little bit that the reaction was more to them being in and out. We'll see what they can do. And there's Hawaii. I mentioned Miami. Hello, Hawaii. Uh, as they, get ready. <laughs> they came back, by the way, from a 15-point deficit to beat UC Santa Barbara in the Big West Tournament Championship game. Congratulations to Hawaii, our Big West champion. Our 6-11 matchup features the number six-seeded Michigan Wolverines taking on the 11-seeded UNLV Lady Rebels. Okay, Michigan stands up. Their second straight 20-win season. Finished the season 2-4 and four in their last six games, but three of those losses coming to AP-ranked teams, so they are battle-tested. As for UNLV, we see it. They're entering the tournament on a 22-game win streak. Single season record with 31 wins. Certainly the pride of Las Vegas. Congratulations to the Lady Rebels. And in our 215 matchup, We've got the number two seeded Utah Utes taking on number 15 Gardner Webb running Bulldogs. You see the Utes there celebrating. Oh, today. and we, in honor of Holly Rowe, the great Holly <laughs> Rowe, we've got to give some love to the Utes. Alyssa Peely, 20 points per game. She's a bucket. They won the Pac 12 regular season. They make eight threes per game, but they do it together 18 assists per game. Holly Rowe said that team was slept on. We weren't talking about them enough. Utah, stand up. She absolutely did. Uh, as you see Gardner Webb there, a lot of gritty, I see. Okay, good to know. Congratulations, you will be dancing as you are going to face Utah in the first round. Alex Fuller, former Lady Vols. Yes, yes. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Gardner Webb. Yep. And finally, our 7-10 matchup in Greenville 2. Number seven seeded NC State Wolfpack will face a Princeton team that's had 14 straight wins. You see NC State celebrating. Okay. Where is everybody? I was going to say, they kept everyone in the back. They're like, we want the ladies in the front. We want them there. <laughs> and Princeton. There and we there go. is Princeton, your Ivy League champ. Won four of the five Ivy League tournaments that have been held. Certainly the pride of the Ivy League. Their first round matchup, NC State and Salt Lake City. Uh, so there it is. 
We have officially revealed the Greenville regions, one and two. You were joking, Drea, earlier that this is like the, what is this, like the big Sean uh, bracket, if you will. Last week took an L, but oh, next week I bounced bounce back. back. Yeah, this is the bracket that people got bounced in their conference tournament. If you look at all the single digit seeds, only two of them made it to their conference tournament championship. So this is the team that, listen, we got bounced. Can we bounce back in the big dance? And, and when I look at this region, it is uh, experience in the tournament is so important. When yeah. you look at the one seed, Indiana, last year, Sweet 16, two years ago, Elite, Elite Eight, they have the experience of being in this moment. Look at what South Carolina did last year. They got bounced in the SEC tournament. They lost themselves all the way to get a national championship. And lost it. <laughs> so it don't mean nothing yeah. if you get bounced out of your conference tournament. What are those double-digit seeds we didn't really talk about? Florida Gulf Coast, they could really shoot it. They beat Virginia Tech last year in the first round. All they have to do is wake up in beast mode. Yeah, I was, was going to have you. That was good. I didn't see where you It was more there. Big I Sean. It's yeah, fine. Okay. We've, like got much, we've got much more revealing. Were you ready for that, Rebecca? I, was I? Big Sean. Rebecca's the one that told us to go with Big Sean. <laughs> she gave me the reference. Um, so much fan. more as we for continue. The Seattle to region. The <laughs> <laughs> She's ready for the Seattle region. We'll go a little Nirvana there. If we will, <laughs> there right? we go. There are so many more teams waiting to have their names called as we are live at over 60 locations. The NCAA Women's Selection Special continues after this, presented by Capital One. Stick around. We want to win a national championship. We're going to do it. History for the Hokies. You do it. The Dukes are going dancing. St. Louis, you're going dancing for the first time. March is here. Thank you, Group Nation. Earning double miles on gas with the Capital One Venture Fund. Break a break a one, Nana. It's Chuck a truck in a sweet 16 wheeler back on the road again. On the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. That Willie. I love is watching me ball. Things haven't been quite the same. There's a haze on the horizon, babe. It's only been a couple of days and I miss you, yeah. Nothing really goes to plan. You stub your toe, or break your can. I'll do everything I can to help you through. If you're feeling down, I just want to make you happier, baby. Well, you just saw it. The Creighton women, just like the Creighton men, are going to play on Friday, and they're going to be the sixth seed. Pretty convenient, huh? Now, the problem is, hopefully, hopefully, the Creighton women will have either an early tip time or an evening tip time because the Creighton men are tipping off at 3 o'clock in Denver, Omaha time against NC State. So fingers crossed. My guess is, and, and who knows, it really depends on, you know, the scheduling of ESPN and the networks. But my guess would be that they would have Notre Dame in a more prime viewing slot. So my fear is that there could be some overlap on Friday with the Creighton men's game and the Creighton women's game. We don't know that officially. We'll get the tip-off times a little bit later on. But if you missed it earlier, the Creighton men at Denver against North Carolina State, that game will tip off at 3 o'clock. We will have coverage right here on 1620 The Zone. Well, not here on Zone TV, but on 1620 The Zone AM on Friday afternoon with Nick Ball and I courtside at 2.30. We will have more information on the women's tip time, hopefully before we leave the air tonight. Back to the selection show and stay tuned. We still have reaction from Coach Flan and players still to come right here on 1620 The Zone TV. Champion Kentucky back in 2012. As we say hello back here in the studio for the NCAA Women's Selection Special. So many teams, 68 teams vying for an opportunity to also call themselves national champions. We have already revealed the entire Greenville 
bracket. Are you guys ready to move on to yes. Seattle? Yes. All yes. right, let's do it. Let's do it. And all right, we will start with your 116 matchup. Top seed for Seattle three, the Virginia Tech Hokies, who you've been caping for them for a while. When, when did I start talking about Virginia Tech being Months a sleeper ago. team? Yes. Being a sleeper team for a one seed, it was yeah. quite some time ago. They got the two-time ACC Player of the Year, Elizabeth Kitley. Yes, they lost to Miami. They lost to Duke. But they avenged those losses in the ACC tournament run. They've won 11 in a row. They are hot. And Elizabeth Kitley. I'm going to get into Elizabeth Kitley a little bit later in the show with an actual breakdown. But let me just tell you, she is a bucket. That one-foot fadeaway is extremely hard to guard. They've got the inside play. They've got the outside play. They space the floor for her to operate. And when she can't score, she finds her teammates to knock down threes. Very, very high on the Hokies right now. The Virginia Tech gets their first ACC tournament championship in program history, and they get that one seed they'll face, 16-seeded Chattanooga Mox, who in their first season under Sean Poppy are making their 16th tournament of their first 20-win season. Lone tournament win coming back in 2004, so they are looking for a huge, a huge upset in the first round as they face the Hokies. In your 8-9 matchup, in Seattle, we've got eight-seeded USC Trojans taking on number nine South Dakota State Jackrabbits. We take up take. There we go. Hey, Drea, you're young. What is this? <laughs> Why does everybody think I'm so young? I'm on it. Funny young friend. It's my second time I'm saying I'm it. almost 30. You've got, okay, and there we go. Yeah, okay, this out. I know. This is okay. what are they, now, what dance is this, Rebecca? What dance should I know about here with South Dakota? Uh, they're not dancing. I mean, there they're we dancing. go. Do your jackrabbit. <laughs> they can hear us, so we can just sort of instruct them on what to do. Congratulations to both teams, as that's your 8 9 matchup in Seattle Regional 3. For your 4 13 matchup, we've got the four seeded. Tennessee Lady wow. Volunteers. You say, wow, Drea. Rebecca, what do you make here of Tennessee being a four seed? Well, they, to me, watching them play, have played like one of the top 16 teams in the country this season. This has been an interesting year for Tennessee, up and down. They played a really tough schedule, but they are led by two players who are so difficult to defend in Jordan Horston and Rakia Jackson. Certainly St. Louis are about to learn that. Their first NCAA tournament appearance. They made the NIT tournament four of their previous seven seasons. So congratulations, ladies. You are dancing for the first time. That your 4-13 matchup. For your 5-12 matchup in Seattle 3, we've got fifth-seeded Iowa State Cyclones taking on number 12 Toledo Rockets. Bill Finley and Ashley Jones have led the Cyclones to winning the Big 12, 12 tournament championship. This is how they score. They're either going to make threes, they're going to get layups, or they're going to get to the free throw line. And they got weapons all around. Modern day analytics that yeah, work right that? there. And how about Toledo? They've had a rocket ship of a season. 16 game win streak tied for their longest win streak since I was a senior in high school. And I can tell you I'm a lot older than Drea, who claims <laughs> that she's not old. It's time for me to go. Yeah, exactly. Congratulations, Iowa State and Toledo. You are dancing. To the bottom of the Seattle Regional 3 bracket, we've got your 314 matchup, third, third seeded Ohio State Buckeyes. They're taking on number 14, James Madison, as we react. There we go. Okay. Is it a business trip or are they just now hearing this, Ohio State? Ohio State Buckeyes. knew they were getting in. Apparently, they're sure. just hey, ready like, to start playing. You better oh, hold on to your purse it's coming. and play it's in coming. Ohio State because yep. they are still waiting to happen. There you go. <laughs> I like this. It's a business trip for them. They're like, fine, we got a couple of balloons and some water bottles. We're fine. Uh, it is their 27th NCAA tournament appearance, so certainly they are locked in. For your 6-11 matchup in the Seattle region, we've got the North Carolina Tar Heels taking on the winner of the Purdue Boilermakers or the St. John's Red Storm. I think North Carolina might be a little under here. I had them a little, a little higher in the bracket. I think they could do some damage. They're healthy. They weren't always healthy in February. They've got all their pieces back. I think North Carolina is a potential, a little bit higher seed that could move on and do some damage. Certainly, you know about Purdue CP. As you boiler see up. There. Yeah, Let's boiler go. up. Uh, the only, first and only Big Ten national champion was Purdue back when you were there. They're back in the tournament for the first time since 2017. And St. John's, you see them there. First 20 win seasons since 2016. Congratulations. Oh, did you see the Dougie? I know you know the Dougie. Okay. He had a Dougie. There no, I know go. the Dougie. There That's right up my alley. I'm so old, it's called the Douglas. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Here Carly, we go. No. All right, as we move right along, saved by the reveal. Your 215 matchup in Seattle 3, the two-seeded Yukon Huskies will face the 15-seeded Vermont Catamounts. 
Yeah. UConn's in two? Yeah. UConn is in two. Oh, is two. This is something that we debated. Uh, we do, as you look here at Vermont celebrating, more gritties. I'm loving things that I can understand. 17-game win streak for Vermont. We'll certainly get at, into UConn and sort of the big picture look there. As we continue to reveal the Seattle regional bracket, we've got our 7-10 matchup next. The seven-seeded Baylor Bears will take on the 10-seeded Alabama Crimson Tide. That's your 7-10 matchup. There we go. A little reaction there from Bama. Okay. Hey. There we go. There we go. So congratulations to Baylor and Alabama. Who's getting the final one seed? Something that we have been debating time and time and time again. All will reveal itself as we've got the final bracket reveal on the NCAA Women's Selection Special forthcoming. Stick around to find out who gets that final one. Is it Iowa? Is it Stanford? Is it Baylor? Sheesh. Mm. <laughs> Girl, I'm about to have All right, we have a commercial break. We're going to give away some prizes while we're waiting for the full bracket reveal. Don't forget, you have to be present to win. You must be present to win. So here's what I got. For the $100 DJ's dugout certificate is Nathan Retzlaff here. Nathan. No. We're going to go down the line then. How about Chris Haller? Are you here? I'm just gonna, we're just going to keep going. How about... Jane Mann. There it is. You're going to DJ's dugout. Bring some friends. Jane, uh, Creighton will contact you. We already have your information. So Jane Mann for uh, for uh, DJ's dugout. All right. For a foursome at the Players Club. How about Alex Cove? There it is. Foursome at Players Club. You are going to go make some divots at one of the most gorgeous golf courses in the Omaha metro area. Okay, did you get that, Hannah? All right. Let's try uh, four tickets to a women's basketball home game of your choice next season. That'll be UConn. Taylor Yort. Taylor, congratulations. You are going to see this unbelievable team next year play. Taylor's got, uh, got the four tickets. Finally, uh, four tickets to a men's basketball home game of your choice. How about Jill McClure? Jill, are you here? Jill, Jill, going once. Let's try it again. How about Neva Bauer? Neva, Neva, I need you to be here. Neva, let's try again. Gabe Gonzalez, let's go. Congratulations. You, my friend, are going to see the men's basketball team. We have your contact information. All right, congratulations to all the winners. The NCAA Women's Selection Special, presented by Capital One. ESPN Tournament Challenge is back. The number one bracket game. Download the ESPN Tournament Challenge app. Scan the QR code to sign up. As soon as the men's and women's fields are announced, you can fill out your brackets for a chance to win a share of $75,000. The men's brackets are already open. The women's will open at 9 Eastern, and that is, of course, because we are not done actually revealing the full field of 68. So to do that, we're back on camera, and we're ready. Again, so much intrigue on who would get that final one seed, and we are about to reveal it as we reveal the Seattle Four bracket and your one seed in Seattle Four, the Stanford Cardinal facing Southern Jaguars or Sacred Heart Pioneers. And this is a Stanford team that stumbled in the Pac-12 tournament, but they are dangerous, they are deep, and they have the experience of being to the Final Four the last couple of years, including a national championship two years ago, led by that young woman, Haley Jones. Cameron Brink having an outstanding year on both ends of the floor as well. They have many shooters. They've got size. They've got depth. Stanford, when playing their best basketball, is going to be a tough act. 
you say experience, you mean 99 NCAA tournament wins? Is that the kind of experience you're talking about? That's, that's or, the yeah, kind. That's okay. Uh, Southern Jaguars or Sacred Heart Pioneers as we check in. Congratulations to the Southern Jaguars representing the SWAC who are looking for their first NCAA tournament win as a conference and Sacred Heart in their 10th season with Jessica Minetti back in the tournament for the first time since 2012. And your 8-9 matchup. We've got Ole Miss taking on Gonzaga, Drea. Oh, I'm excited about this match. I love the 8-9 matchups in general, but we've got to give some credit to Coach Yo at Ole Miss. No Shakira Austin, who was dynamic in the WNBA, no problem. She's got transfers that come in. Maya Taylor, Marquisha Davis, Angel Baker is a bucket. Ole Miss, they're ready to go. And you see Gonzaga, them Bulldogs, they're ready too. Oh, they get the cute factor too. Another gritty, but this time from a little boy. We love that. Only West Coast team, by the way, with multiple players averaging over 16 points a game. They are deep. We look at our 5-12 matchup in Seattle 4. Our 4-13 matchup is going to be the Texas Longhorns taking on the East Carolina Pirates. You see Texas there with Vic Schaefer. Always in a blazer. Always in a blazer. He hasn't thrown it yet. <laughs> hasn't come off yet. He hasn't come off yet. And Rory Harmon there, your Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. Yes, the gritty. Okay, yeah, East Carolina. There's a lot of gritty happening right now. It's it's basically the narrative of the show, taking on the East Carolina Pirates. 23 mid wins, most since 2009 and 10. They've got oh, a Oh, they're chance. chancing. They're they chancing. They win so good. far. Yeah, I like that. Uh, we've, like got, we've got a net, a net necklace. They're doing it all. Congratulations. As we look now at our 5-12 matchup in the Seattle 4 region, the fifth-seeded Louisville Cardinals will take on the 12-seeded Drake Bulldogs. Okay, Louisville. We talked about Louisville defensively. What are they like compared to last season? The defense has been something that they have to get going. And the Drake team, that's exciting. Yeah. They can shoot it, but that's going to be good offense against good defense going against each other. And Mikasa Robinson moved into the starting lineup for the Louisville Cardinal, and the defense got better. Is she similar to? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't and how about Drake riding a five-game winning streak? Not exactly starting from the bottom, but they're here. Okay. Uh, as we continue with great, the though. bottom of the Seattle Regional Four, I'm just here for the bad dad jokes. It's fine. We take a look now at your 314 matchup. Number three, Duke, taking on number 14, Iona. Another one of those defensive teams. Duke, that's how Carol Lawson has had success in the ACC this season. It's built on the defensive end. Right. We check in now on your 6-11 matchup in the Seattle 4 region. Six-seeded Colorado Buffaloes will take on number 11, Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders. Charlie has this, and he'll explain a little later as a potential Cinderella story, Middle Tennessee. As we take a look there at Colorado, the Buffaloes, 23 wins. Mostly for team. Well, MTSU, MTSU is a team that could pull off an upset. Carolyn talked about that Cinderella team. Who could it be? They can shoot it, baby. It could be this team the right Raiders here. They can shoot it. They're also riding a 10-game win streak. Shoot or shoot. As we take a look at your 215 matchup in the regional, Seattle regional, two-seeded Iowa Hawkeyes. CP. A lot well, of debate about them being a one seed. Well, Caitlin Clark, she will earn your respect. If you didn't put respect on the Iowa Hawkeyes, giving them a one seed, added two. They're going to come in. They're going to shoot it. We saw how determined they were when game day went to Iowa yeah. City. They're going to carry it carry that on through the tournament. Those fans were amazing. They, they were those great. Those fans were incredible. So much they're, fun. Yeah, they're absolutely incredible. That year, 215 matchup. And in your 7-10 matchup in Iowa City, number seven seeded Florida State taking on number 10, Georgia. Hard, hard. Look, Coach Abe's got a defense that's really hard for teams to figure out. They, she matches up well. Diamond Battles is excitement. And it's not from making buckets, but getting steals for the Georgia Bulldogs. That's her right there, standing up, dancing hey. in the middle. Yep, there hey. we go. I said it's great. Hey. <laughs> hey. Uh, jo okay, let's go. Only team with more appearances in the NCAA tournament, Tennessee. Look at Georgia stand up at your 7-10 matchup. As the full bracket has been revealed, let's take a look at our bracket tips presented by Nissan. Congratulations to all 68 teams. Since the tournament expanded to 64 teams in 94, top three seeds are 335-1 and one in the first round. That lone loss belongs to one seed at Stanford and fell to 16 seed at Harvard back in 1998. Each of the last 10 titles have been won by a one seed, and top three seeds have won all 40 of the national championships. Brackets are officially open, so scan the QR code to download the ESPN Tournament Challenge app and make sure to fill out your bracket.
All right, Blue Jay fans. You probably already made all your travel plans. It's official for the sixth time under head coach Jim Flannery. The great Blue Jays are part of the NCAA tournament field. Let's give them a round of applause. Your Jays with a record of 22 and 8. On Friday, we're heading to South Bend. We're going to play either Illinois or Mississippi State. We want to thank all the fans for all of your support throughout the season. Flan, you're already standing up. You know you want to come up here and say a few words. Let's give a big round of applause for your head coach, Jim Flannery. Yeah, well, Brittany and uh, Emma already came up here, so I thought they were coming up here to talk earlier. Um, thanks for hanging around, pep band, dance team, blue crew. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for everything you do throughout the year. Um, to our staff, uh, our, our, our basketball staff, but, but our staff beyond the staff, uh, thank you for all you do. And got a lot of parents and, and people who have followed us all year. Appreciate everything you guys do. Um, you know, when these girls are started playing when they were five or six or seven, I would imagine they, you know, had this dream in their mind and in their heart and uh, to get them, to give them the opportunity, uh, have them earn that opportunity to get to do it again uh, and hopefully do some of the same things that we did last year is pretty special. So I'm really, really thrilled for them. They deserve it uh, uh, because they've worked really hard. They put in the work, uh, not just for the last four months, um, but, but way, way, way before that. And, to the parents who gave them those opportunities, I see you guys and the sacrifices that you make, uh, pretty impressive. So uh, we're super excited. I don't know if you guys remember, but we played right off Interstate 80 last year in Iowa City. And I do know my geography, South Bend is right off I-80. So we are gonna be owning I-80 again this March. Thank you. All right, sounds good. I want to thank everyone once again for coming tonight and for all of your support throughout the season for coming to this beautiful arena. Um, and uh, we'll see you, hopefully, at South Bend. Or you'll be going to South Bend and Denver and back, whatever it takes. Until we see you again, go Jays. Good night, everybody. The time. All right, we're not done yet here at uh, DJ Sokol Arena. The uh, players and coaches are going to be heading back here in just a moment to speak with the media. We will bring that to you right here on 1620 The Zone TV. I'm John Bishop. Great to have you along. We really appreciate you all being out there tonight uh, watching along with the men's uh, selection show a couple of hours ago and now the women's selection show. And uh, Coach Flan's going to be headed back uh, to the press area here rather shortly. In fact, the uh, team's right now gathering for a picture out in front. But uh, an exciting time for both Creighton men's and women's basketball. It is the third time since 2011 that both the Creighton men and women will be in the same tournament, same year, in back-to-back -back years. It's happened now three times since 2011. Now... I have not done my research, but obviously UConn has done it several times, but there's probably a short list, a very short list of programs who have managed to do this in back-to-back -back years, and Creighton has done this. And they have done this during an era where they switched conferences. They went from the Missouri Valley into the Big East Conference, which was not an easy transition. And yet they were able to maintain this level of excellence for over a decade. It certainly helped that they have had the same two head coaches in that time, Greg McDermott and Jim Flannery. But it just shows the strength and the quality of these programs and the support that they get from all of you out there, our great Jays fans, that they have been able to maintain this level of excellence now and are going to NCAA tournaments together same year in back-to-back -back years. The problem is the togetherness might be a little bit too close for comfort because 
Both teams are going to play their first round game on Friday. We know that the men's game is going to be at three o'clock central time in Denver. 1620 the zone will bring you live coverage starting at 230. Hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully, the women's game will either be earlier or later so that we do not have overlap. We didn't have that problem last year. They played on opposite days last year in the NCAA tournament. So we were able to actually watch as Creighton beat Colorado out in Iowa. And then after the Jays were eliminated on Saturday by the Kansas Jayhawks, we were all home and able to watch Creighton get that big upset on Iowa on uh, network TV, ABC TV on Sunday. So hopefully we can at least keep the times of day different, but unfortunately, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a little, uh, it's going to be a little sweating it out here. We're going to wait and find out more here coming up when um, the official tip times come out. I can see that we've got Emma and Lauren back in the press room right now. Coach Vlad is still out here glad handing people. He's just so happy that uh, he hasn't yet joined the uh, folks. He hasn't he hasn't gone back to the press area yet, but he will be here rather shortly. So we're going to head back as Coach Flynn is headed under the tunnel right now. He's headed back to the press area. We're going to head back to the press room now here at Sokol Arena. Emma Ronsick, Lauren Jensen, and Coach Jim Flannery reacting to Creighton's selection. They are the sixth seed. They will take on the winner of the play-in game between Illinois and Mississippi State on Friday, which is St. Patrick's Day, by the way, in South Bend, the home of the Irish. Go figure. All right, head back to the press area right now, and we'll have a wrap-up as soon as they are done next here on 1620 The Zone TV. I have not, no. Mm -mm. Coach, you want to just open up a statement? Yeah, well, I'm I'm thrilled for our players. I think, uh, you know, we <laughs> when you when you finish the conference tournament early, uh, you have time to sit around and think. For the last week, I know I don't know. Well, I don't know what's going through their minds, but I know what's going through mine. But the the good news was we were comfortably in the tournament, so it was a less stressful week. But I think uh, I think they rewarded us for the schedule that we played for his, for the strength of the Big East. I'm I'm. I'm I'm excited that we got five teams in. I think that shows the strength of our league, but I also think that the sixth seed is a is representative of the kind of season that we had and the schedule that we that we tackled and then and, and just you know how we played and and I'm super excited for the opportunity. I think uh, other than South Bend's not warm this time of year, uh, I think it's a it's a great opportunity. I know these guys are gonna do their best to prepare and 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 I I I love our team and, and what we're about right now. And I think it's, um, yeah, I just, I, I think that uh, this team can, can be as special as what we did last year, but it starts tomorrow. Tonight for the coaches, but tomorrow for these guys. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a different feeling coming into this, going to the Big show than you did last year? Um. <laughs> I guess, you know, both of them were obviously super exciting. Um, last year, we pretty much knew we were going to be in. I mean, not as comfortably as this year. You know, we were 10 seed last year, 6 seed this year, and so it's a little bit different. Um, I feel like there's more of an expectation, you know, this year. Um, but it, it's definitely still exciting. How do you handle the differences between going in and nothing to lose versus yeah, I mean, I think that's just something that makes basketball a really fun sport to play is every year is going to be different. Every game is going to be different. You're not going to be playing a perfect 40 minutes. You're not going to be playing a perfect year. So I think that's just what makes it more exciting that we're improving from last year. And what we did last year was super cool. But tomorrow is the start of a new season, even though what we accomplished this year. But yeah, I think that's just what makes basketball really fun. have a little bit more confidence in yourselves from what you guys did go through last year? Um, I feel like we definitely have more experience, you know. Um, we were there last year. We obviously made a deep run. And so I think that helps kind of having that under our belt. Um, 
you know, kind of like the previous question, it's a little bit different, you know, being the higher seed, you know, starting out. Um, but I think we'll take that well, you know, I mean, I feel like for most of the year, we've kind of had that um, to like play to that expectation. And we've handled it well. So um, I think it'll be good. Um, kind of like this, how the season's gone, where you, people like, oh, you know, we know Creighton because they made this deep run last year. Same thing's going to happen in the tournament. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think about that dynamic going into it, where, you know, even on the show today, like, who's going to be the next Creighton? Like, everybody's looking at it like that now. Yeah, I think it's definitely really exciting to be known for that because last year I don't think a lot of teams had us on their radar for anything, uh, sort of the volume of what we did last year and the impact that we had in the tournament. So people definitely know, and I don't, and I think that reflects um, with the other um, lower seeds that are going into the tournament because it's a new season and everyone can, everyone is capable of doing something special. So I don't know. I just think it's really cool that we set that expectation. And like they said, um, when they were announcing the team, saying that who's going to be the next Creighton. So yeah, I think that's really cool. Statement, if you touched on this or not, but. You know, a six seed is basically like a sneeze away from hosting. You know, one game here or there in the season changes that. How do you feel about, you know, I know you have a lot more to accomplish in your minds, but. Oh, sorry. I'll hold off. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for the student athletes? Mordella, how weird is it that you guys don't know quite exactly yet, you know, who you're going to play? Um, yeah, it's definitely different. You know, usually you'll go in more prepared, um, or not more prepared, but obviously just knowing who you're going to play. But I mean, Flynn and the staff is really good at kind of preparing for those situations. And so, um, it's obviously different, but you know, I think it'll be good. Do you guys know anything about either team? Um, not a lot, but I don't know. Our coaching staff has a really good job um, preparing us for games like these, and that's what the tournament's all about, playing new people. And, yeah, I think we're going to be ready. Is your mindset in a different spot compared to last year when you had lost two in a row at the of the tournament? Or does confidence just come from, you know, what you've done in practice and, this, and what you do with the next game? Or... So you guys are on kind of a roll end season and we're really close to making the Big East Tournament Championship. Like, does it feel different than last year at this point? Um, you know, I honestly don't think it feels much different. I mean, last year we dropped those two games at the end of the season. Um, and so that's obviously different. But in terms of how it feels, um, I feel like it feels the same, you know, still going with confidence. Last call for student athlete questions. Good job. Okay. Sorry about that. That's good. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I was just kind of wondering. Um, obviously, the tournament is the next barometer to kind of weigh that against what you did last year. But aside from that, because it's kind of up in the air, you know, how impressed are you with your team's ability to handle it? the expectations that came in with this year and improved them to the degree where you're basically four seed lines better than you were at this point last year, like comparing both, you know, three month comparing the loss. Yeah, I think it like uh, I, I mentioned in my opening that I think it's I think the six seed is representative of of who we are and what we tackled and how we persevered through, you know, a, a similar rough patch like the men did, um, and and came out playing good basketball and certainly we can play better, but uh, I feel like our, our league has prepared us really well. Our non-conference schedule will prepare us. And we talked about that and, you know, I look at it, we played 30 games and really three games so that we weren't in, you know, home Nova, home UConn and at Stanford where we kind of were in it a little bit, but like, I just think we're in it. We'll, we'll be in a good position. I mean, but, but, you know, you also need your players to understand that all, you know, all three of those games that we won last year in the tournament were really, really close games. I mean, you know, the final scores in a couple of them weren't necessarily representative of how close the games were for, and, and, uh, but, uh, I think the thing that I'm, I'm excited about is our team is still balanced. I think that was one of the things from last year's team is so it doesn't come down to one player. Like we're not, you know, you saw 
two of our best players right here. But I mean, we can absorb somebody not having a great game because I think of because I think our balance is there. And when you go to the NC tournament, that's that's important because you know you're going to have somebody who isn't going to necessarily maybe perform at least from a production standpoint at the level that you're used to. But I just I I think that can help you um, even more so in a tournament situation. Fact you don't know who you're playing. I mean, does that does it feel like it's double the work for your coaching staff and then half the time to, to get prepared for that potential opponent? Yeah, I think I think as a coach, it's you know, it's good and bad, right? Because it's good. Those teams have to play and grind out a win two nights or two days or 48 hours essentially before they have to turn around and play us, and they're going to be focused on that game. Um, but to your point, it's like we're <laughs> we're going to spend the next few days doing more generic stuff about, well, okay, we'll do, we'll, we'll do some Mississippi state things and we'll do some Illinois things, but we can't really get too far in the weeds with either of them because it's probably not the the best method of, of, uh, of preparing, but we'll, we'll do some of each. Um, so good and bad though, because I think we'll be able to watch them play live, which is, which is great. Um, and, that'll be a good feel. I mean, that'll give us a good feel, but, uh, so yeah, you, in, in some ways the prepared, the coach who wants to prepare is, <laughs> is, uh, maybe, you know, not quite as comfortable with not knowing who you're going to play. But I think the, the other side of that is those two teams have to go to battle and, and, uh, we'll get to see that game too. What's the benefit of watching an opponent live compared to watching a bunch of games on tape? You can pick up some things in 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 real time during a game that you know just even something as simple as play calls. Like you can you know like I mean I don't know how many times I hit pause and I can't tell if a kid's raising two fingers, three, four because my eyes aren't that good and the screen's not that big. So I think there are some things you know, but how kids react under pressure and oh maybe that that kid's a little more physical than she looked on film or that kid's a little quicker than she looked on film or she likes to go right even more than I thought or left. So there's there's some things you can you can gain from uh, from watching somebody live, I think, uh, and and even having your players. Like I I really thought it was super bene- beneficial last year that our players were in the building um, when Iowa played Illinois State to hear the to hear the noise. And from my standpoint, it's like okay, how do I communicate with the team differently than in most cases that I that I coach them where it's not 15,000 screaming people. And I think there was a, a value to being in the, in the arena when Iowa played their first round game last year. Lane, what did it mean to you to just kind of see from the bracket reveal and talk about who's going to be the next screen? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's cool, but I, it's way more cool for the players to see that because it, I think it lets them know that, that what they did was special and that, the opportunity that they have in front of them is, is special and unique. And, um, cause there is going to be somebody and why not us? We, you know, who better to have, I mean, Matt's okay. We're not a 10 anymore, but, but still, you know, we're only going to be favored in one game on, on paper going, going in. So, um, I think it's, I think it's neat. I think it's, it shows that, that, uh, that there is, we're moving toward more parity in our sport, which is good. Women, uh, side of the Big East often gets overshadowed a little bit. How uh, does it mean to you to have as many bids this year as they got? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, and, and uh, you know, for St. John's to get in and um, for Marquette to get, you know, to climb up to a nine, I think it it shows where the league was. And we had a we had a veteran league this year. I feel like it's it was it's, it was the best it's been. I mean. Of course, it helps that we added UConn, but it's the best it's been in the 10 years that, that I've been in the league. And, and I don't think it's probably we've even had a year that was comparable um, in terms of how many good teams there are and were. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's validation. And now we got to go out and, and win games and prove that we're that good, too, because I think that helps. I mean, I don't think it hurt that I don't think it hurt that we went to the Elite Eight and Villanova won a won a game last year in which they were an underdog. I mean, and that UConn made the championship game, those things help. And so I think if we can replicate that, you know, it, it helps the league going forward. 
how does it feel just the fact that both you guys and Craig Men are in, and ironically both six seats yeah. too? I know it seemed like there were more programs this year though that got both your men's and women's teams in, but this is two years in a row that that's happened. So just kind of what does that mean for you? Yeah, I think it's I think it's special. I think it means that uh, that we we support basketball on a level that allows us to to achieve and uh, that the community's behind us, the university's behind us, but that also that we're attractive as a basketball school. And when we recruit, that's one of the things that we, that we throw out is that we're, we, we, we have that reputation. And I know as, as the big East finishes up their 10th year um, that there's a lot of pride in where the league is as a basketball league. And, um, and I think that's, you know, certainly Villanova winning two national championships on the men's side has a lot to do with that and the success of the men's program. But I think we're, I think we're moving in the right direction on the women's side too. I'll, uh, I'll take that one. Um, you know, it doesn't matter because you can play one game and if you don't have it here. You know, yeah. But how battle tested is this group compared to other ones you've taken to this, this point considering the 20 games you played against the best version of the biggest you've been in and then non-conference that featured what three yeah. tournament teams that you played against your conference. Yeah. How about a test you play this group compared to other teams you brought here? Yeah, I think we're I think we're super prepared. And that doesn't that doesn't mean we won't be nervous on you know <laughs> when we step on the floor, but and it doesn't mean that you know there won't be some things that we're still not as good at as I want us to be, but I think that that it it does give us a chance to overcome s some obstacles that maybe a team that didn't have as many obstacles can't overcome in a in a in a tournament setting. So I'm I thought our I thought our conference tournament was 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 great for us. And I told him after the game, I said we played two great prep games for the NCAA tournament because they were nail biters. One, you know down to the wire, really hard fought games. And, I, and we didn't play great, I don't think, but we, I, I thought we played pretty well. And, uh, but I think, I think we'll have to play better, but not, you know, two deviations better, just maybe a, a half a deviation better. <laughs> um, and if we do that, we'll be in great shape. And because I think, I, I don't, we played two really good teams and, and two high, high intensity you have to execute down the stretch games. And I don't think they're, I think that's great. You know, our, so what I'm saying is our recent, our, our recent uh, schedule is going to help us too, uh, not just what we've had for the last four months, but you know, to go on the road, our last three road games were, you know, Seton Hall, UConn and Marquette and to get two of them and, and almost win at UConn. I mean, that's, you know, we won, we won 12 road games. Um, I think there's a lot of things that w that we can look at and point to as as reasons for optimism, but um, but it's a one and done, so nothing's guaranteed. What's your uh, conversation going to be like, or conversations about what you're going to do with uh, you know, Rachel and Carly, two players that you know are going through this experience for the final time? What, how are you going to compartmentalize their their nerves and, and their edginess, knowing that this is the last? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's tough. I think you just, I think you're positive with them in practice and recognize their contributions in practice so that they're, so when the ball gets thrown up, that they're, that, that they're confident and not overthinking and not, you know, I mean, th that their, their, their height meter is at a nine instead of a 10 and a half or an eight and a half, nine versus a 10, because I think you know, Rachel runs there anyway. <laughs> Carly kind of runs there. So just, I, I think just making sure that they, they understand how prepared they are and, and building them up in practice this week. Any further questions for Coach Lambert? Thank you guys. Cool. Appreciate you, it. Coach. All right. Well, that'll wrap things up oh, this weekend. Yeah. I saw you guys from, um, just make hello, check, check. I don't know if we're, oh, I think we are. We're back. Welcome back. John Bishop with you one final time here from inside of DJ Sokol Arena. We want to uh, thank everyone here at Creighton University.
for uh, doing all their great hard work. Joe Wilman, especially on the broadcast end and uh, my producer, Chris Prudon here on site with me, just uh, making sure that we are all connected and good to go. So again, both Jays, men and women, six seeds going into the NCAA tournament, both playing on Friday. We know that the men's time is at three o'clock pregame at two 30 on 1620, the zone. I have not yet seen tip off times yet for the women's tournament. Hopefully we will have those before the end of the night. So for all of us here at 1620, the zone TV, we appreciate you tuning in. Go Jays and stay tuned. 1620, the zone, 1620, the zone.com and the zone mobile app for all the latest on Creighton men's and women's basketball in March madness from DJ Sokol arena. I'm John Bishop. Good night, everybody.